to change the face and the language of the small business world. We're changing lives. We want to take the Latina entrepreneur, empower them, give them opportunity where there wasn't. Um, you know, me growing up the way I did, you know, we weren't even in the conversation in that way. And the opportunity to do something, that's all anybody wants. Nobody wants a handout. But that opportunity can change your life. Which is why Lopez is partnering with nonprofit Grameen and its CEO, Andrea Jung, to deliver a total of $14 billion to Latina entrepreneurs by 2030. Together with their male counterparts, Latina entrepreneurs make up one of the fastest growing groups of small business owners in the country, creating businesses at a rate six times faster than other racial or ethnic groups. But in spite of that, Latinos are 60% less likely than their white peers to get their loans approved by national banks. Latina owned businesses have grown 44% in the last 10 years. Morgan, the capital that is going is paltry and it's unacceptable. They just want to have an equal chance. Why is giving someone the resources to start a business the way to close that gap, to make things a little bit more equitable? Yeah, because we can, we can just be the kind of, uh, you know, working in the kitchen, the valet parkers, all this stuff, like the, the traditional kind of things where people think of Latinos in these roles. And the point is, is that we want more than that. We just, we, we have bigger dreams than that. And for me, even in my own business, I was like an artist who was like making billions of dollars for other people and not really even realizing it, just like happy to be in the room. And then started to realize, wait a minute, I can make my own perfume. I can do this in my own way. I should own a part of this business. I remember watching you. I was growing up in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I would see you come across the screen and you were so proud. <laughs> right? And mind you, this is a time when there weren't a lot of roles for Latinos, mm -hmm. and especially in Hollywood, mm -hmm. or they were pigeonholed, right? And you showed up on the stage and said, no, no, no. I'm Jennifer Lopez. This is my name. I'm loud and I'm proud. This is my body. This is who I am, <laughs> yeah, right? And, and you made the world reckon with you and what it meant to be Latina. Why was it so important to you to always have Latinidad, just the, the, the concept of being Latino, front and center. It's just who I was. And I think my mother and my family raised me to be proud of who I was. And so when I went into these worlds like Hollywood, where we were not represented at all, I almost felt like, like, a, like a unicorn. I'm, I'm Latina, I'm Jennifer Lopez from the Bronx. And my parents are Puerto Rican, I'm Puerto Rican. And I think it made me feel uh, special. Even the whole kind of like body thing was such a thing. It was like, everybody was like size zero models, tall, blonde, you know, beautiful, a beauty, a certain type of beauty, but there was other types of beauty there that was a narrow I grew up window with. Of there was a narrow was window. And I was beautiful. like, my mother was also beautiful. She had a beautiful, I mean, my dad, you know, and my, my we always talked about their big butts and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not to reduce myself to that because that's what then they tried to do after, right? Because I was so okay with it. They made fun of me for mm. it. I, I have to credit my, my parents and my family for making me feel um, like I was, worth something, and that I didn't have to be anything other than who I was. My grandmother used to make us dresses. And How do you help these women have the same thing? What do you say <laughs> I to the generation? I try. I don't have any magic uh, kind of formula for success. What I've learned is that if you can follow your heart, if you can be true to yourself, and you can work really hard, the difference between being successful and not being successful is not giving up. And I just didn't give up. And you're here? And here we are. <laughs> and here okay. she is. I, mean, I don't think there's anyone who works harder than Jennifer Lopez, but to hear her say her parents made her believe that she was worth something. Mm -hmm. I mean, that like really just resonates. that, yes. It, it shows you, I mean, the power of having someone feel seen and mm -hmm. having someone feel worthy. Yeah. And I right. think what's so cool about what she's doing now is really putting action behind that, mm -hmm. right? She's trying to create generational wealth because yeah. that is what they say will help sort of bridge the wealth gap. I mean, this is about giving resources to a community 
community that just wants a start, yeah. right? I mean, and then she's talking about the values her parents instilled in her, that if you work hard and you can do it, and it's giving people the chance to do just that. It's beyond time. And just those uh, numbers of the number of yeah. Latinas who have businesses and the number who get loans yeah. is, is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And we heard that somewhere in this interview where you were sitting down, it must have been amazing anyway, mm -hmm. there was another family member of hers nearby. Who was it? Who was it? Special guest, maybe a new husband oh. named Ben Affleck. <laughs> Oh, right there. Oh, what was he doing? Was right there. He was watching her, that. adoringly, cheering her on, wishing her well. It was very, very cute. Are they so cute together? They were so I haven't cute seen together. them together since the wedding. They were so affectionate and lovely, and the crowd just loved. And you know what was so cool is they were so open yeah. to speaking yeah. to the women yeah. and just encouraging them. And that's what it meant. Seeing them was encouragement. Talking to them was encouragement. Their time was encouragement. Yeah. Well, seeing Jayla, I mean, she's done it for years now, as you know well, use her platform yeah. for good to yeah. try and lift, lift other folks. Up. And by the way, it was good to see you on stage mm -hmm. moderating that. I was real proud of you. I said, way to go, Morgan. Thank That's you. awesome. We did it with our partners at Telemundo, yeah. so everyone was included in yeah. both languages, That's and it great. was a great event. Was great, great job. Time. Way to go, Morgan. Thank conversation, you. indeed. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We are back with an interview we've all been looking forward to and a first look at Sydney. It's a new documentary about groundbreaking actor Sidney Poitier, who passed away in January at 94. I sat down with Oprah Winfrey, the film's producer, director, Reginald Hudland, and three of Poitier's daughters during the recent Toronto Film Festival. Poitier rose to stardom during the civil rights era, earning his first Oscar nomination for The Defiant Ones. That was in 1959. In 1964, history was made when his leading role in Lilies of the Field led to a win, and his lasting on-screen legacy includes To Sir With Love, In the Heat of the Night, as you see here, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. But even more important for this performer who paved the way was his role as a father. Take a look. The winner is Sydney Portway. It is a long journey to this moment. You're watching the Academy Awards. The limos, the glam. I was sitting on the linoleum floor and was babysitting my half-brother and sister and watching on a Magnavox black and white TV. Then he wins. I was 10 years old and I had the thought that if a colored man could do that, he could do that. Mm. I wonder what I can do. For Oprah Winfrey, this early memory was a turning point, an inspiration to produce a new documentary about the man who became her mentor and friend called Sidney. You think of yourself as a colored man. I think of myself as a man. Sidney Poitier was raised on Cat Island in the Bahamas by his parents who were tomato farmers. The world I knew was quite simple. I didn't know there was such a thing as electricity or that water could come into the house through a pipe. I never thought about what I looked like. I didn't know what a mirror was. Poitier moved to the United States at 15 with no blueprint for the racism he'd face when he arrived. I just go, how did he do it? Mm. How did he, with no role models, and he made a path for all, all of us. us. 
Oscar-nominated producer Reginald Hudlin directed films including Boomerang, Marshall, and now Sydney. We all stand on the shoulders of Sidney Poitier, but it's much bigger than entertainment. The ripple effects of his meteor hitting the ocean exactly. is so mm. big, Yes, we cannot quantify exactly. his global impact. Quincy Jones had a 42nd birthday party for me at his house, and Sidney Poitier was there. And I remember going downstairs, turning a corner, and he was just standing there, and I, froze. Not everybody gets to meet their heroes. Not everybody does. He exceeded every measurement I ever could have imagined. It's always hard being the first. When you're the first to do anything, people are coming at you from all sides. I had a conversation with him about what do you do with all the criticism and trying to be everything for everybody. And he said, my dear, it's challenging when you're carrying other people's dreams. There's also a part in the documentary that takes us to 1967, 1968, this time of civil unrest. What was that like when things are spiraling literally around him and he's this Hollywood star? There's always that question. Do the times make the man as if the man make the times, mm -hmm. right? And you know, the answer is always a little bit of both. Here is this revolutionary force that's transforming Hollywood, political activism. He's all these things at once. Because he's carrying it on his back, because he's the one that we see. He's the one that's visible. They call me Mr. Tibbs. In the 1970s, Portier began to direct. And then when he gets behind the camera, he brings other black people behind the camera in. He Open in. the doors. Open the doors for so many others. Right. We have 1,300 black people working uh, on, on the film. For Sherry, Anika, and Beverly, three of the icon's daughters, he was just dad. Well, long before it was a phrase on a t-shirt, he was clearly a loving girl dad. What do you remember about your dad growing up? We used to travel a lot. We'd be in a hotel room and bored and we would put makeup on him and do his hair with bows and barrettes and then we would call room service and make him go to the door and answer it. And he loved to just make us laugh and giggle. And we talked, you know, quite a long time about different things and, you know, the cosmos as, you know, he was very much into, yes. yes. <laughs> he was very much into the stars and the planets and what was going on. What do you miss? I miss, oh, it's gonna make me cry. I, I miss hugging him. And sometimes I can still like, there's like a muscle memory. You can still feel the person, even though they're not here. And I, you know, I miss talking to him. I still talk to him. And Sherry, what about you? His laughter. Oh, no, I love when he clap his hands and fall oh, out. And yes. Oh, my God. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I just miss his laughter. Do you still feel him? Every day every day. You were saying that you had a chance to see the documentary. Talk to us a little bit about that. It was just like an amen after a sermon. Aww. You guys captured the essence of him in the film. How does that feel? You all honor us so much with your words. He is the best man I have ever known, heard, read about. I, I don't know anybody more extraordinary than Sidney Poitier. I walked away, as you can imagine, feeling so emotional. I couldn't help but think about my grandfather. Mm -hmm. They were only a few years apart. And the weight that he had to carry, not only, you know, just in his roles, but just as a man yep. and the responsibility that swirled around him. And he was so loved. And as a young woman with a career and a family, talk yeah. about a life well lived and how he was able to balance it. And as much as he, we know him for his career, he was such a good father. Yeah. So it was just such a good interview. So I would encourage you to go to Peacock and Today All Day. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just like get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not DC as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are uh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man, it's okay. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. 
This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. South Korean K-pop group Seventeen is taking the world by storm. The 13-member band is actively involved in the songwriting and choreography of their hits, which have been streamed more than two billion times. Their videos, which have millions of views, and their sold-out arena tours both highlight the group's visually stunning synchronized dance routines. They first made a splash in 2015 with their debut EP, 17 Carat, which cracked the Billboard World Album's top 10 chart just one week after its debut. This summer, they embarked on their Be The Sun World Tour, and I joined their dedicated fans, who are known as Carrots, to watch them at the Prudential Center in Newark, New Jersey. Later, I caught up with members Hoshi, Joshua, Vernon, and Dino. I went to your concert last night. I had an amazing time. How do you hype each other up before a show? We have this ritual where we always say, like, hiting, which, like, basically means let's work hard for the concert. <laughs> yeah, this do you is need our, another hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is our, like, signature ritual before, and then, like, every concert. With all 13 That's members, great. we make a full circle. Three, Three two, two, one. Uh, yeah. yeah. I just thought the crowd was amazing. You seem to attract a diverse crowd. How important is that to you? 다른 문화와 다른 언어인데도 저 음악으로 이렇게 하나가 될수 있는 게 기쁘고 신기한 일인 것 같아요. My mom's American and my dad's Korean, so I've already been experiencing that multicultural environment. So having people experience that like through our performances. I think it's a really beautiful thing. When you're up on that stage and you see the lights and you see the energy in the crowd, how does that feel? 어딘가로 몰입이 확 되는 것 같긴 해요. 그냥 일상생활을 살아가는 느낌이랑 다르게 내가 어떤 그냥 한순 그한 부분에 한 감정의 부분에 완전히 취해 있다는 느낌? You guys just had your new version of World released in collaboration with Anne Marie. Yeah. What's your dream next collaboration? DJ Khaled랑 해도 Yeah. DJ Khaled, yeah, yeah, yeah. another one. We the best music. <laughs> so let's dance. Okay, okay let's dance. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Five, six, seven. One, two, if I let you ta, down, and chak. Yes, that's it. That's yeah. it. Oh yeah. Chak 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 chak. Yes. Oh. That's it. Yeah. One I'm two. Oh yeah okay, okay. One, One two. two. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for not making fun of me. So should we try that last part? Head, Head shoulders, shoulders hip, leg, leg, leg. 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 Yes. yes. Shoulder, head, leg, point. Chak chak my. That's actually in good. My, yeah. In my new world. You got it. I think we're ready for music. Okay. You got Let's this, go. you got this. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Yes.
for life. You Loved sure it. are. <laughs> and By The Way 17 will be back in the U.S. Um, on December 10th for the LA3C Culture Festival. So check them out because they're so much fun. Oh, I love it. They should bring you on you, stage. Thank you, Donna. I know. you got to dance with them on stage. <laughs> Nestled deep beneath the rolling hills that cradle scenic downtown Missoula, Montana. The hottest ticket in town for a world-renowned meal isn't one of the restaurants on Main Street. In fact, it's not a restaurant at all. In this tiny kitchen basement, enticing smells from Syria to Iraq to the Congo waft and rise. Haroon Asani is an Afghan evacuee from Parwan, more than 6,000 miles from his new home. When you were in Afghanistan, did you know Missoula, Montana existed? No. <laughs> <laughs> but he looks right at home, cooking for Missoula's United We Eat, a once a week meal service that pays refugee and immigrant chefs to cook more than 125 takeout meals for the community. And the community is obsessed. Everything I've tried so far has been great. For most of Missoula, I think that this is probably their best opportunity to get exposure to diverse food. And that's the deal. The chefs get to share their food, express their culture, and provide for their families, while Missoula gets a taste of the world. So far, nearly $50,000 has been paid to more than two dozen chefs who've cooked nearly 6,000 meals for the community. They make us like to feel we are Welcome here, and they like refugee and immigrant to share food. Tickets so typically sell out in less than 30 minutes. We set reminders on our phones for Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Are you surprised by the amount of demand that it's generated? Not at all. This town is um, hungry for what we offer. <laughs> The initiative is a cornerstone of Soft Landing Missoula, an assistance organization for refugees and immigrants that started back in 2015. I think it offers an enormous amount of dignity. Um, these folks often come from cultures where sharing food and hospitality and generosity are significant parts of their culture. And to be able to offer that to the Missoula community is a really important thing for them. The barrier breaking universal language of good food. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love um, yeah. <laughs> now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. Top story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. It's a city known for its barbecue and blues, but just minutes from the hustle and bustle of Beale Street, Memphis, Tennessee is also home to a vibrant yet vulnerable transgender community that faces social and economic challenges. We're in the Bible Belt of the South, and it's a, it's a red state in terms of housing access and discrimination, employment access and discrimination. There's no real legal protections for trans people. Nationally, one in five trans individuals is said to have experienced homelessness at some point in their life. And nearly a third live in poverty. Those figures are even higher when you account for race. I was born and raised here in Memphis, Tennessee. When Kayla Gore was just 23 and newly transitioning, she experienced homelessness while living 1,500 miles from the city where she grew up. It was very, very scary. After returning to Memphis, she entered a transitional housing program and began working without Memphis, the local LGBTQ community center. During that time, Kayla says she started to see a lot of trans and queer people kicked out of their homes at the age of 18 
some rejected by their families. While there are services for individuals experiencing home insecurity in Memphis, many are faith-based. There's lots of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, and more importantly, a lot of those shelters are separated by sex assigned at birth. You're forced into a situation of either outing yourself or staying closeted in an environment where you could be incredibly unsafe. There's also a lot of trans folks of color here, so then you also kind of double down with racism. They have a lot stacked up against them. The pandemic exacerbated that. A survey by the Trevor Project found last year more than 80% of trans and non-binary youth said COVID-19 led to a more stressful living situation. Hoping to change that, Kayla, who'd been able to purchase her own home, which she shared with others who found themselves experiencing homelessness, founded My Sister's House. We wanted to provide like a space where people can thrive and they can actually start to grow um, and heal the trauma that they had you know, experienced in their youth. Originally a word of mouth program, my sister's house aimed to provide emergency services and shelter to trans and queer people of color. It's for us by us, like it's trans people at the helm of it and it's from a perspective of someone who's been there. I was homeless as a youth, so I, I remember what it was like being vulnerable. As my sister's house evolved, so did their mission. Now the group is aiming to build 20 homes for trans women in Memphis. It's safe to say that I did not come from a background of building houses or working with plumbing and electrical, uh, but it is safe to say that I came from a family that had really love and compassion for the community that they live in. Originally planning to build tiny homes, they're now renovating existing homes because of the rising costs of everything, including lumber. Using a lottery of individuals they've previously helped, recipients get more than a shelter, they actually own the house. It's a different feeling when you um, have your own place. Jeanette Adams moved into her home just a few months ago. That's a tiny house, but it, you know, it's big to me. Jeanette had been living with her mom and has a supportive family, but being able to live on her own has boosted her confidence. I felt free. A lot of people, especially trans women, we don't get a chance to own anything. Kayla says that's exactly what she's hoping to provide those selected to receive a house. Trans people are boxed out of economics in so many different ways that we have to build our own economics. This is how people built generational wealth 100 years ago where their families had small homes. So it's nothing new that we're doing. It's just that we're doing a unique thing for a community that really deserves it. Just a couple miles from Jeanette's home, crews are replacing the electrical system at another property. This will be our fifth house that will be occupied. Modi James will soon call this two-bedroom home her own sanctuary. I'm ecstatic about it because it would be mine. It's my, it would be my home, not my house. Modi says she does not feel safe in her current living arrangement. I've been trying to get a home on my own. They take you to the ringer and they expensive. I see nothing and I live nothing but poverty. I'm trying to overcome it. LGBTQ advocates in Memphis say my sister's house is giving people more than a place to live. It also created visibility and hope and inspiration for the trans community and for trans people of color here in the South that just wasn't there before. If I had the opportunity to receive the resources that we provide today, I couldn't imagine what my life would be like. Kayla hopes to expand and replicate what my sister's house has done in other cities. She also hopes the program has something of an expiration date. I would want the legacy of my sister's house to be that we came, we conquered, and we disappeared because we no longer were needed.
Hey there, everyone, on this fine Monday. Thanks for starting your week off right with Pop Start Plus. I'm Joe Fryer in for Carson. Today, ahead of the show, the one and only Winona Judd. She was out on the plaza and opened up about the loss of her mom, the great Naomi Judd, and the power of music. Then we'll switch gears. Any fans of the movie Halloween Town out there? One of its stars spoke to us for our flashback series and revealed what it was like to work with the legendary Debbie Reynolds. Plus, a hocus pocus moment we could not pass up. Bette Midler from our vault in 1993. But first, Carson has today's pop star. Uh, guys, let's get to Taylor Swift because there's a lot to talk about. In case you somehow missed it, the chart topper released our highly anticipated Midnight's album on Friday and dropped a music video for the lead single, track three on the record, is called Anti Hero. Here's a little bit. It's me. Taylor doesn't didn't do any interviews for this record, but this is the song. Yeah. This is the one. This is an anthem of self-loathing. This is mm -hmm. all of her insecurities. Everything she can't stand about herself is lyrically in this. Oh, wow. One of the lyrics wow. in this song Tell is, me. Midnights become my afternoons when my depression works the graveyard shift. All the people I've ghosted stand there in the room. Oh, wow. Ooh, Think that's about a good that. lyric. Yeah, that's the lyric to that one. Wow. Uh, so she broke all the Spotify records that you can imagine. Before the album even hit the 24-hour, Midnights became the most streamed album in a single day. Taylor broke the record for most streamed artists in a single day also. In Spotify history. Plus, according to Billboard, the new music has already achieved the largest sales week of any album in the last five years. You can buy it on any format, digital, vinyl, cassette, eight track for Uncle Al. Right, thank you. Now we just need to wait for the Swifties to finish decoding <laughs> the record. Next up, Beyonce. We promised two big stars. Well, you got it. Pack your bags if you're a Beehive fan because the Queen is going on tour, dropping the big news during her mom Tina Lawson's annual wearable art gala over the weekend as part of the star studded event. Guests were invited to participate in an auction where one of the surprising items up for grabs was a package to see Beyonce's 2023 Renaissance World Tour. Photos from inside the event revealed the shows are set to get kicked off this summer. Plus, whoever the lucky high bidder was at the event also won a backstage tour at one of the concerts from Miss Tina herself. Pretty big item up for auction there. Next up, Back to the Future. A new teaser is out for the upcoming Broadway show based on the beloved movies. It shows a sneak peek at how someone from the original cast is giving the new crew some tips on time travel. I don't know. A used car, huh? Looks like it's got about three million miles on it and all this stainless steel. Great, Scott. Can this thing really do 88? Trust me. <laughs> all right. I'll take it for a test drive. It's the Winter Garden Theater on Broadway. I'll be back in no time. I doubt it. I think you're going to be at the Winter Garden for a long time. Uh, I can watch those two in a sitcom. Yeah. Of course, that's the original Doc Brown, Christopher yes. Lloyd, alongside Tony winner Roger Bart yes. Al, who did the, played that role on yeah. uh, in London. In London, yeah. London's West End, and they're going to be opening it here in August, which I oh, I, I cannot wait heard. to see that either. I, I'm so excited. In fact, the soundtrack is on Spotify right now. <laughs> of course. It's terrific. What? If Roger Bart ever needs an understudy, if he gets fish point, yeah. we should mention we, we know who to call for that. Yes. Well, that's right. I, I'm, I'm 88 miles per hour. Uh, so, yeah. 1.7 gigawatts. 1.7 gigawatts! Oh my god! You can do it. That's right. I get Dylan to be a Martin McFly, we'd be set. Oh, that's going to be fun. Finally, our friend Mandy Moore. Congratulations in order to Mandy and Taylor, her husband, who have welcomed baby number two over the weekend, the couple sharing a peek at newborn Oscar Ozzy Bennett Goldsmith. Mandy, uh, feeling great, revealed the little guy showed up a little later than expected. Okay. Easy delivery. She wrote on Instagram, he is beyond words, and we are so grateful for our family of four. Big congratulations to our friend Mandy Sweet. and Taylor. Sweet. And Gus is a big brother now. Oh, okay. Big promotion. Great. You know, I've known Mandy since she was like a kid. 13 yeah. on TRL. Wow. Wow. It's been so fun to watch front row the benchmarks of her life. Yeah, I know. What a lovely lady, yeah. and I'm so happy yeah. for her. Us yeah. too. We love her. All yes. her dreams coming yep. true. Yep. Now to the reason we call this show Pop Start Plus, we have even more headlines for you. First up, Jay Leno. The former Tonight Show host is back with another season of Jay Leno's Garage. And in this week's episode, he has a very special guest stopping by for a drive. President Joe Biden. The two chat about the future of cars while riding around in a converted 1978 Ford F-150. Take a peek. What do you think of this idea? I think this is incredible. Taking I, old cars and retrofitting. I, no, I, I really do. It's a new hot rod. If you just got in this and drove and didn't know it was electric, would you know right away? Does it feel different to you? It feels different three ways. One, it's quiet. Right. Quiet as hell. Number two, if 
I accidentally hit it quickly, look at that. Oh, yeah, yeah, it goes good. You know what I mean? It goes good. We just laid rubber. Let me know when you're doing that so I don't bang my head again. <laughs> okay. Third thing is, everything seems to me to be a quicker response. Right. This is the only time you get to drive, isn't it? Yeah, me. it is. It's a God's <laughs> truth. And you can catch more from their drive Wednesday at 10 p.m. on CNBC. Finally, Kenny Chesney. You can now call the leader of No Shoes Nation, Dr. Chesney. Over the weekend, East Tennessee State University awarded the country music superstar with an honorary doctorate for his commitment to the future of country and bluegrass music. Chesney graduated from ETSU in 1990, where he was a member of the school's bluegrass program. He opened up about the major milestone on Instagram writing. I was also able to reconnect with the man who taught me how to play guitar when I was in college. It felt so great to be back. Congrats, Dr. Chesney. And that's the latest for you today. Coming up, country star Winona Judd's visit to our plaza. Stay with us. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We are back here on Pop Start Plus. The country music world lost Naomi Judd back in April. And during a visit to the plaza, her daughter Winona opened up about her mother's legacy and how creating new music has helped her heal. Country music legend. Winona Judd, the oh, Grammy stop. winner, come on girl, oh, has been making music for decades. <laughs> and of course, her mom, Naomi, took the world by storm. Those two together performing mm -hmm. as the Judds. And now as Winona works to process the loss of her mom, she's back on stage using her beloved music to heal. Let's take a look. Winona Judd paying tribute to her mother, Naomi, performing their classic River of Time at a celebration of Naomi's life two weeks after her passing. Mama, he's crazy. The mother-daughter duo launched their careers in the early 80s, going on to win five Grammys and topping the charts dozens of times, solidifying their place in music history. But the road to the top of country music was not an easy one. Naomi often spoke out on her struggle with mental health issues, opening up on Today in 2017. Get down to this deep, dark hole of depression and you really don't think that there's another minute. The Judds reunited on stage for what would be their final live performance at the Country Music Television Awards just weeks before Naomi's death. Then on May 1st, the day after Naomi's passing, the Judds were inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. I feel so blessed and it's a very strange dynamic to be this broken and this blessed. Naomi and Winona had scheduled a final concert tour this fall, but after Naomi's passing, Winona is now hitting the road alone, saying it was what her mother would have wanted, celebrating their honor and her legacy. Winona Judd, welcome back. We're so happy you're here. Can I just pause for one second, just to comment on what you just said right there? After you guys were inducted into the Hall of Fame, you said you were both broken and blessed. How, 
how are you feeling today? I'm writing a song called Broken and Blessed, and I wasn't going to cry, but I love you and have known you so long. I'm somewhere between hell and hallelujah. <laughs> and these shows are healing me one show at a time. And all my friends are coming. And it's like the greatest party you throw yourself before the end. Hmm. I feel like I'm doing a victory lap. And the fans are watching me. And they're for me because they grew up with me. Mm -hmm. I've been around that long. Mm. And they're bringing their next generation sisters. And I'm seeing up to four generations at the shows. It's mm. a crazy time, Hoda, because it's not about show business. This is a celebration of life, mm. as well as people going through their own stuff while listening to the songs of what they went through. You had originally, this was originally a tour for you and your mom. Mm -hmm. um, if not for this tour, where do you think you would be? I would be at home planning my next big moment. Mm. You know, you sit at home during the pandemic and you talk about what you're going to do and you can go back out. That's what we do. We go home. <laughs> and like with your kids, you play mm -hmm. in your home and your family. <laughs> and then you think, what's my next big moment? Because yeah. that's what we live for. That's what we work for. Um, pain comes in waves. I've, whenever I've suffered a loss, I, sometimes it comes like a tidal wave. And sometimes it's calm and you almost forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What part of that place are you in? It depends on what state <laughs> I'm in and what state I'm mm -hmm. in. <laughs> I will cry and then go right into the next song. And I mm -hmm. keep Kleenex right here. Did At you, all times. Your mom used to do that, didn't she? Uh -huh. <laughs> How did you know I that? You know why I remember? Because when she, she's been here many yes, times, she had a couple of things that she would stash away in there. I just sing and I cry and I do the same thing every day where I'm at. People know me really well. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know me, check me out. Uh, I'm fun <laughs> and I'm real and I'm broken and I'm blessed and I'm sassy, you know, and I'm crying and snotting through the songs. But... Thousands of people are showing up to celebrate with me. Of course. Me. Who's your rock through this? My granddaughter, Kalia. She's six months old, and she doesn't speak yet. But she looks right through me, and I know you know what I'm talking about. They look right through you. What does she give you that no one else She gives can? me hope. She gives me hope. Your daughter's name is Hope. One oh of your God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know that. They give you hope. They give you something to think about other than yourself. Because mm -hmm. so much of what we do is about us. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be with her because she doesn't care what I look like. <laughs> Have you, um, like, I don't know if the word is, how are you coping with, with the way your mom passed? Or have you... Have I have you a grief it? counselor and a life coach. And yeah. I call them and I say, I'm d I don't understand why. And they'll say, ask yourself what? What can you do? Huh. It, they help shift me over into another lane. And they helped me to go, I can do something, even though I feel hopeless right now. I can do Instead something. of asking why, mm -hmm. ask what. What mm -hmm. can I do right this minute to get to the next breath, to the next right thing? Can I talk about the sisterhood that's around you? You've got Martina, who's going to be performing with you today. You've got Trisha Yearwood, little, all hey, these. Uh, I mean, you have an incredible group of singers mm -hmm. who are all mm -hmm. surrounding you. Yes. I mean, what does that feel like for it's you. incredibly overwhelming too much it's like at a funeral when you have your entire family there mm -hmm. and yet you wouldn't have it any other way mm -hmm. even though it's it's the hardest thing to do sometimes is just to be present and do the next thing that you're doing and they're there to support country music as a community well you also have additional tour dates that you are adding because everybody wants your ooh, ticket ooh. girl everybody can everybody go everybody wants it everybody can where go are they now. going TheJuds.com will tell you what the next 15 shows are going to be. TheJuds.com, because you needed more days because everywhere you went, people are selling As out. As of today, yeah. the, the tickets are on sale. I, I just found this out like a week ago. They said, we're adding more shows. And I said, okay, <laughs> what am I going to do, yeah. Hoda? Sit at home yeah. and complain? Yeah. Uh, 15 more mm -hmm. shows. Uh, you can get yours now. Good. So. It's, it's a city concert pre-sale. We're happy to be uh, linking arms with you on this. And we love you so mm much. You've been there for a long time. Oh, I love you. Amazing to have Winona with us. Coming up here on Pop Star Plus, we're taking a trip to Halloween Town with the beloved movie star.
The general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Because, Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are oh, I was you trying got it. to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. Love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Certain movies are inextricably tied to Halloween, like the beloved Halloween Town. The film featured Debbie Reynolds as a witch and grandmother to Marnie, played by Kimberly J. Brown. For our flashback series, Kimberly spoke to R. Donna Farrison about her memories from the set. Kimberly, I feel like I'm living out a fall play date right now. <laughs> My childhood play dates were watching <laughs> you. I'm thinking about the Disney Channel voiceover, Halloween Town, starring Kimberly J. Brown and Debbie Reynolds. Take me back to a little bit of that time when you were younger. When you auditioned for this role of Marnie, you starred in the first Halloween Town when you were 13. What was the process like auditioning at that young age and then getting the role? I think I did two rounds of auditions. I just loved Marnie so much. She was so courageous and determined. I really admired her in a way. If that's possible with characters. And I was so excited when I found out that I had gotten it. Roles like that didn't come along all the time, like to be able to kind of play a teenage witch, really. I feel like it's almost more common than it was back then. I was thrilled. You say you admire her. How would you describe Marnie's character? I think Marnie, you know, she was trying to figure out who she was at 13. Okay, I'm practically a grown up. I'm certainly old enough to make my own choices. She had so much courage and determination and really took a lot of risks and just kept moving forward without even being sure of like what was gonna happen next. And so many young girls look up to her then, but also now people are starting to watch this movie for the first time. How does that make you feel not only knowing that, you know, it's sort of become a Halloween cult classic, but also garnering this new demographic of fans too. All aboard for the mortal world! It's incredible. It really blows my mind. I meet multiple generations of fans. I meet grandma and her daughter and then her young daughter who are all watching it. It's just amazing. It's gone way beyond our wildest expectations when we first shot the first one. I'm so grateful to the fans because they have really just given it this whole life and over social media and now with Disney Plus, young kids are watching it. So it's really just incredible. I'm so honored that people still love it. This is Halloween Town, just like the book. Oh, or maybe we fell asleep on the bus. Yeah, that's it. It's all a dream. Decorations, the goblins, the witches, the ghosts. And Grandma, she was a dream too. I love that you mentioned that this movie is for all different generations, from the grandmother to the mother to the daughter. And I feel that that's what 
was echoed on screen as well with you, with Judith, with Debbie Reynolds. What was that relationship like to work with the legendary Debbie Reynolds? That is pretty incredible. And also at such a young age, was there anything that she caught you or said that sort of shaped you? Oh, absolutely. And that's the way they use their magic. She was just incredibly kind and treated all of us kids as peers right from the very start. She looked out for every actor, every crew member on set. She loved telling stories and jokes about her life and making you laugh at her expense was always one of her favorite things. But over the years, I think Marnie and Aggie's relationship very much mirrored what Kimberly and, and Debbie's relationship was. And there's so much of just getting to be around such a legend and just such an amazing human being that will just always stay with me. Was there a specific scene you remember being sort of the most awestruck by? I think in the first Halloween Town, flying on the broom with, with Debbie was a really special scene and day for me. It was our last day of shooting and it was, we spent the entire afternoon up on a big stool in front of a blue screen. And that was like my first day of just one-on-one -on -one time with her. And so it was so special for that reason, but it was so exciting to, to see it afterwards and go, oh my gosh, look, we look like we're flying. Okay, now I have to get to the good stuff. Can you tell me a little bit about your love story with your fiance, Daniel Kuntz, and just what is in the secret sauce of former <laughs> co-stars who then meet up later in life and get together? It's completely unexpected. Um, people ask us like, oh, well, you know, you must have known something while you're filming or had some, you know, had crushes or something. And that was absolutely not the case. Your only power was the power to keep us apart, Cal. And now you don't have that power anymore. I think it had been at least 10 or 15 years since we had seen each other. We had stayed social media friends for a bit and I was filming some new sketches for my YouTube channel. Were we dating during Halloween Town 2? <laughs> and that is a big uh, no. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> for many reasons, but that was a long time ago. I thought it would be fun to have come have him do some because the fans, you know, would love it. And so I reached out and we ended up getting together and, and catching up. And just through the course of that kind of started realizing we started getting feelings for each other. And it was like, oh, wow, this is unexpected. When we finally went public with it, it was it's been so fun over the years just to watch all the fans reactions. Most of them warned me, you know, to continue to hide my spell book and, you know, that he's, he probably is, you know, there's probably something else going on. It's been so much fun to, uh, to, you know, see the, the fans' reactions to it all. I think that Halloween at your guys' house would be awesome. It's yeah. definitely extra special holiday now, considering uh, just our lives, our relationship, everything. It's amazing how it's all come together that, um, is it, and I was gonna say art imitated life. I guess it's life imitating art in a sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you hope that people take away from the movie and from the spirit of Halloween? I hope that they take away that embracing yourself is so much more important than what other people think. I think that was always the common message throughout all the Halloween Town movies. And that is the the great magical aspect of Halloween Town in the sense that they celebrate Halloween. It's Halloween every day, but also everybody is, is loved and cherished for exactly who they are. And I think that's why Marnie takes to it so quickly and all of the Cromwell kids do. But I think that's just so important, especially now that kids and even adults, you know, that we all get reminded yeah. of that. We can all use a little bit of Marnie's spirit. Absolutely. Thanks, kids. See you in the afterlife. So terrific to hear from Kimberly. Coming up, another Halloween classic, Hocus Pocus. We found a great clip from our vault with Bette Midler. Stay with us. You get one beautiful so life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Good morning, welcome to 
to you today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Just ahead in this half hour, we're gonna introduce you to Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load. Every single morning. Welcome back. You've probably heard a mention or two of a little movie called Hocus Pocus this time of year. Well, we found a clip from our vault with the legendary Bette Midler as the first film was being released back in 1993. When I watched you all running around doing your thing, mm -hmm. I wondered if you ever burst out laughing because it's it, if i were one of you that's what i would have done i mean were you we did. to do that well we did we laughed when we felt we had hit it you know we would we would get uh, we got a lot of satisfaction out of really nailing the the little bit that we had set out to do and uh, i laughed all the time i was always like girl you are so funny <laughs> <laughs> to kathy or to sarah or to me, myself uh, Sarah Jessica and, and Sarah Kathy. Jessica, my good friend Sarah Jessica and Kathy, absolutely adore you, idolize you. Uh -huh. Were you able to to help them and teach them? Well, I didn't know that they idolized well, me. Well, Kathy, Jimmy I, said that you you were on top of her Christmas tree. She was a. It turned out that Kathy, Kathy and Jimmy was an old fan of mine, and that she had come looking for me once when I lived on Barrel Street in New York City, and she had left a, her her her. Uh, left a letter and a picture for me or something like that and she reminded me of all this and of course I I, I had to say Kathy I, I I was unaware at the time <laughs> but she took it well and Sarah Jessica was uh, a different kind of a fan but um, she was an Annie right she was and an Annie she, she and you all had the fabulous. same music coach or voice teacher out we had the whatever. same voice teacher and uh, I we were singing we were singing that song um, uh, I put a spell on you, and I walked into the studio, and they had their microphone, and of course I had my microphone, because they were singing the background parts. Well, I, I started to sing, and I looked over at them, and, and their little knees were like, they, they had, <laughs> they were totally freaked out. And they, said, and they came to me afterwards and said, we couldn't believe we were standing there singing with you. And That's right, they were, the, the back, I was very touched the by The backup it. girls, the right? The backup girls, they did a great job. How was it uh, flying? Did you feel a little like Peter Pan? Was that a blast? Uh, it, I can't say it was a blast. It hurt like hell. You know, the thing about the broom was you had to find out, you had to figure out how to, you know, keep it, between, uh, forgive me, keep it between your legs and fly and do all this stuff at the same time. And it took us a, a, a few weeks to figure, because it, it hurt so bad. It put a lot of strain on your back muscles. In fact, I, you had I, to go to a chiropractor yeah, after I this wrenched, film. I wrenched a, something here, a trapezius or something. And I, I, ne I haven't really fully recovered. <laughs> Workman's comp. <laughs> and, um... <laughs> I liked when Kathy and Ajimi uh, flew on the Hoover vacuum cleaner. That was cleaner. great. I think that's going to be the biggest laugh in the picture. I personally uh, put my money on that laugh. It was hysterical. It was wonderful. <laughs> Is this pretty much a kid's movie, you think, that I think it has a uh, tremendous physical comedy for grown-ups and they and the grown-ups do love that but for the kids it's so it, ha it has lo lots of laughs but also has just a little bit of a terror too not terror like they usually give you but not fun, like jurassic not park like terror. jurassic park terror but uh fun terror you know where you know oh, they're just it's just but ben midler you know that sort kind of, of hansel and gretel like As, yeah yeah and uh, I, we have very high hopes for it. But you know, hey, I've had plenty of high hopes before. <laughs> and had them dashed. So what? 
nothing like a spooky and funny throwback. Okay, friends, thanks so much for being here on Pop Star Plus. Tomorrow, your guide to all the Halloween movies you should have on your watch list this week. We'll see you then. It's so Perfect. beautiful, and it I would great. literally look at this and never know that there were no eggs in this. No eggs. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Incredible edible eggs really are, well, pretty incredible. From a simple hard-boiled egg to a stunning souffle, eggs are essential parts of so many meals. They give great lift to pastry, make dishes super decadent, and they're also just delicious on their own. But how do you replace them in a plant-based diet? I'm going on a cross-country hunt to find out how chefs are cooking up savory meals and sweets all without cracking a single egg. Right now, it's breakfast time. So I'm headed to a local spot right here in Brooklyn that's turning chickpea flour into a breakfast staple, the perfect scramble. Hi, Sama. Amanda, so nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Amanda. Nice to meet you, Cheyenne. Cheyenne, nice to meet you. So excited to be here. Should yeah. we get inside? Let's do it. Let's, Let's go. go for it. Awesome. Cheyenne Willis and Amanda Fox own and operate Satan's Helper in Brooklyn, New York. The couple, who wed in 2016, dish up vegan twists on classic New York City deli dishes. Their specialty? Remaking breakfast staples with a variety of plant-based eggs. A lot of people, when they go plant-based or they try and start eating a more vegan diet, right? Mm -hmm. Eggs are something that people seem to miss. So you do a lot of really interesting things with eggs here. And I want to know, how do you mimic the texture and the flavor sure. of a regular egg? Tofu just is never going to be <laughs> eggs, so you just have to get <laughs> to that closeness. Yeah. So with our tofu scramble, Cheyenne uses a process of doing three different kinds of uh, tofus. So they'll do one block of tofu in cubes, so you get that like little cube aspect. They blend some aspect to make it creamy, and then some they mash with their hands. So you get like a different sort of a scramble, like a creamy scramble with like little bits of bite to it. From tofu scrambles, to a chickpea-based omelet, there's no shortage of creative plates here. There's a lot of different avenues you can take with plant-based food, right? So why did you choose a vegan deli? We're both from Pennsylvania. We both come from like getting your sandwich from the grocery store, and it's just like a classic nostalgic feeling. I grew up cooking with my grandparents and my mom, and it was just always classic Americana food. So we decided that this would be the most natural road for us to take, um, and this is just what came naturally to us. Amanda and Cheyenne first met during high school in Pennsylvania. A few years after graduation, they reconnected and quickly fell in love over their shared passion for cooking. We've just been always obsessed with food. Cheyenne's actually a classically trained pastry chef. The two moved to Brooklyn and worked together at several restaurants across New York City. They tied the knot at Dunwell, a vegan donut shop in Williamsburg. What is your favorite part about working with Cheyenne? We're in each other's brains, 100%. <laughs> After working in traditional restaurants, they both had dreams of creating a more equitable eatery, run with a focus on treating staff fairly. So we decided that when we made our space that it would be everybody's on the same playing field. We're all equal. It doesn't matter who technically owns it. It doesn't matter who does what or whatever. Everybody gets paid the same. We all are just here working together as a team. In 2018, Amanda and Cheyenne started running a vegan pop-up, serving homemade seitan at various locations around Brooklyn. Seitan, the restaurant's namesake, is a high-protein meat substitute made from wheat gluten. The chefs use seitan to recreate plant-based deli meats, like bacon and roast beef. I think the interesting thing about our food is we base it on those flavors that you're so used to. 
So when we were coming up with our salami recipe, I was like, okay, so what goes into actual salami? And we took those ideas and those flavors. So it became the base for this nostalgic food that we can now make vegan. After a successful run, the pop-up graduated to a storefront in 2020. Putting down roots in a permanent location was vital for the couple, who wanted to create an inclusive space for vegan and queer communities. We get to meet so many different types of people, and obviously because we're a queer-owned company, we attract all the queers, which is perfect with me. We have our loyal customers that have been with us from the jump. The same person who ordered from my very first pop-up came in the other day. I was certainly ready for my breakfast sandwich. Cheyenne took me into the kitchen to make a Satan's Helper signature. All right, so what are we making first, Cheyenne? So we're gonna start with the nomlets, our chickpea flour-based egg. You say nomlet? Nomlet, Like yes. nom nom. Absolutely. I love that. Yes. <laughs> so we're gonna start with some chickpea flour here. Okay. To make a perfect nomlet, building the right eggy texture is key. Cheyenne mixes oat milk, lemon juice, and oil with chickpea flour, or besan, a common ingredient in Indian cuisine. Have you tested this with other flours, or have you landed on chickpea flour being the best for I an eggy? I have definitely substitute? tried with regular flour, but it is weird. So that's why we use the chickpea, just to okay. keep it like, lighter, fluffier, okay. less harsh. It looks really nice. It smells good already. Yeah. A few simple spices amp up the flavor and color of the dish. A lot of spices in here to Tons. make it nice and nomlety. Yeah, <laughs> delicious. I feel that uh, a lot of times in vegan cooking, people don't add a lot of spices. Cheyenne's secret to upping the savory factor is kala namak, or Himalayan black salt, which comes from North India. It adds this, this really nomlet. <laughs> wonderful um, sulfuric acid taste and brings that egg flavor really to the that front. That egginess, yeah. 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 The nomlet cooks for about five minutes before getting a flip. Look at that. Stunning. Gorgeous. Yeah. So we'll know when she's done, when she's a little bit firm. Okay. Yeah, she's pretty much good to go. This looks really good and it smells amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. It's like, it's such, it's giving me such a savory pancake vibe, mm -hmm. even though it is also an omelet. So I love it. The omelet is served with even more plant-based breakfast staples. All right, so I have our housemate. The bacon. Bacon here. This is made out of seitan, I'm It assuming. is, and there's like oats and cheese, Ooh. jalapenos, a bunch of wow. fun stuff in here. We do not skimp on anything. Love that. And so I fried this up, and we're just gonna lay this gently down. Amazing. Just give it a little bit of fluff there. Love it. And then we would just close the lid up. Ta-da, a totally vegan BEC. There I go. Woo! Whoa. Whoa, Cheyenne, whoa. Lots of flavors. The omelet is crispy. The bacon is super flavorful. It's delicious. Thank you. The eggless egg sandwich really blew me away. Now it's time for lunch, and I happen to know a fantastic ramen spot on the other side of the country. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. You'll get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah, I love you too. <laughs> Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah, I love you too. <laughs> Thank you.
Among the countless ramen spots out there, Ramen Hood in downtown Los Angeles is truly something special. Everything on the menu is totally vegan. Ramen Hood was co-founded by Top Chef Season 2 winner Ilan Hall and world-renowned chef Rahul Kapkar in 2015. There you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited. Ramen Hood is one of just a few restaurants in the country specializing in plant-based ramen. And they were the first to offer a vegan soft-boiled egg, a traditional topping for this comforting soup. Rahul, you yes. make vegan ramen. Can you tell me about why you do that and how this all got started? Uh, it was actually my friend's idea. I was working in Denmark at the time, and he called me and he was like, hey, I have this idea for a vegan noodle concept. That friend was Ilan, who had been running Esh, an Israeli barbecue joint in Brooklyn. Why make it vegan? <laughs> My business partner had a restaurant that was very meat heavy, and he was catching a lot of flack from vegans on Twitter. <laughs> and that is kind of, it's not like the catalyst, but he was just kind of like, all right, well, I mean, I can do vegan food. In 2014, Ilan invited Rahul to cross the Atlantic and bring his expertise from one of the world's most prestigious fine dining restaurants, Noma in Copenhagen. Part of the reason he called me was because the restaurant I was working at, we were serving, I think, like 24 courses at the time, and like 16 of them were vegetable forward. And then once we kind of started talking about it and refining it, it just made sense for us to do ramen. Ramen's something I grew up eating. It's like a real uh, kind of like comfort food for me and definitely nostalgic. I used to come home from school and have a bowl with my grandmother. Traditional ramen broth is usually made with pork, beef, or chicken bones. Sometimes it's a combo. But Ramen Hood uses vegan dashi, a liquid base made from kanbu and shiitake mushrooms. This is a spicy garlic sunflower seed broth. Uh, we've got some bean sprouts in here, baby bok choy, uh, king oyster mushrooms, scallions, sesame seeds, chili thread. After pressure cooking and blending the ingredients with sunflower seeds, the chefs are able to create a creamy, umami-rich broth without any animal protein. But Rahul thought their vegan bowls wouldn't be complete without a classic topping, a creamy, soft-boiled egg. Why was it important for you to add this vegan egg into um, this ramen? People expect an egg in ramen. It provides that creamy texture that kind of people are looking for. And in like a traditional bowl, it can be a really nice, like different thing to be eating. Like you've got chewy noodles and you've got this pork and then, you know, you've got an egg that's like a soft boiled egg. It just makes the, the broth richer and it kind of makes your entire experience eating the bowl feel richer. Ramen Hood's secret? Mixing the dashi from their ramen broth with agar, a gelatin made from seaweed. Teach me how to make this. Yeah, this is pretty straightforward. So we're gonna take 500 grams of our broth. Okay. This is the agar here. We're just gonna put a little bit in. Dump this in here. So I'm stirring this around to make sure the agar doesn't clump and settle. Okay. And how long does it take to get to the point where you want it to be? Um, not long. It'll take a, just a couple minutes. After the agar mixture simmers, it's poured into a custom mold to create an egg shape. How many of these do you make a day? Uh, about 150. Within just a few minutes, the liquid firms up, and it looks and feels just like a boiled egg white. This literally tastes like, first of all, this tastes so good. It tastes like ramen broth, like a lot of umami, but also the texture is very egg white. Yeah, because it's this just the broth. It's, like, it's got the richness from the sunflower seeds. Yeah. To make a whole egg, the chef uses a melon baller to scoop out room for the yolks. That's so crazy how like gelatinous it is. Like a egg white. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna go. Don't judge me. First time. That was pretty good. That was better than most people's first try. When the egg whites are firm, it's time to fill them with the creamy yolk. It's vegan mayo with food coloring and black salt, like okay. Indian black Call salt. Enema, yeah. yeah, so it's got the uh, egg flavor to it. Okay, yeah. cool. And you so, just pipe it in? Yeah, here. Yeah, that's it. Just I'm go. like looking for my just, just go to, yeah, just do the rest of it. There you go. 
This jiggly, soft-boiled egg helps complete a ramen experience that hasn't been available to many vegan foodies for years. Okay, I'm going for the egg. I feel like I owe it to us to go for the egg. I think you should just one bite it. Wow, it's so good. I just, I truly haven't had ramen in years because I mostly can't eat it anywhere. So this is revolutionary for my life. Like, this is a plot twist for me. I love it. I'm coming back. I bring my parents next time. This vegan hard-boiled egg might be pretty advanced for a home chef, but I've got a super easy egg swap for baked goods that only requires two ingredients. The general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are, I was oh, trying to it. do it on the slide. Live TV, man, it's okay. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Uh, yeah, I love you too. <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. If you're looking to replace eggs in your baked goods, maybe you're allergic, you're vegan, or you simply don't like eggs, a flax egg might be the substitute for you. I'm gonna show you how to make two flax eggs today. So we're using two tablespoons of flaxseed meal with five tablespoons of warm water. You can see it right here. This is gonna blow your mind. It's super simple. Grab your flaxseed meal, add it to a bowl, clean bowl. And next, I'm just gonna add my warm water. I know, it's challenging, right? We wanna give this a nice little stir, get everything nice and incorporated. All of the flax should get in there. We're gonna let this sit aside for about five minutes until it gets nice and thick and gelatinous. After, you can use it as a sub for your eggs and your baked goods. So I'm just gonna let it hang out. It's gonna chill out, have some spa time. See you soon. Welcome back. It's been five minutes while I waited for my flax egg to do its thing. You want to wait until it's nice and gelatinous. So that might take you a couple extra minutes. No worries. Let's check the texture. Check this out. She's thick, gelatinous. I keep saying that word, but it's true. Flax eggs really work like eggs to help bind and thicken your baked good. It's not going to rise exactly like eggs would, but you're not going to taste it at all. It's still going to be a delicious and perfectly baked baked good. I'm not saying this belongs in a museum, but it might belong in your cookies, okay? Flaxseed isn't the only swap vegan bakers can use to replace eggs. One bakery in Portland is using all sorts of different ingredients, from applesauce to tofu, to make plant-based desserts that are totally decadent. Hey, podcast. 
podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love ya. I love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. When it comes to pastry and baked goods, eggs are pretty essential. They definitely help bind things together in baking. They provide moisture. They have some fat and protein, which just provide the structure for the baked good, you know, for it to, to rise, they give lift. So they are really hard to replace. This is Lisa Clark, the founder of Petunias, Portland's first all-vegan and gluten-free bakery. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming in. She's also an expert in egg-free baking. It really depends on the product that we're making and the qualities that each egg substitute has and what you want the end result to be like. And the other ingredients that are in the recipe, you know, it has to work well with what you're making. We use a lot of coconut yogurt, which gives a lot of moisture and it helps make things a little lighter. Applesauce also does help to give moisture um, and a little bit of lift. And chia seed meal, I love, and it's very healthy for you, which is added bonus. We use this like in our chocolate chip cookie. It works really well in cookies to help bind things together and give a nice texture. This is silken tofu that's pureed with a, a milk, so you could use coconut milk, almond milk, rice milk with an immersion blender. That's really nice in like a pound cake that we make or a poppy seed muffin that we make. It helps give some structure and stability. In 2003, Lisa learned she was intolerant to dairy, gluten, and eggs. She decided to take control of her diet by turning to one of her favorite childhood hobbies. My mom is who taught me how to bake, and it's just something we did together all the time. She had ALS when I was a child, and she passed away when I was 12, uh, which was really, really hard, and so there wasn't a lot that we could do it together because she was so limited physically. She was in a wheelchair and I was the youngest of three and I was home with her all the time and helped take care of her. Um, and one thing she could do was just explain to me how to bake and tell me what to do. And I would have our little KitchenAid mixer and you know follow the directions and get up on my stool and do it and I loved it. And it's one thing that we could do to bond and to do something together. She had a little ceramic pig's head that hung over the stove when I was a kid and her name was Petunia the pig. And so when I was trying to think of a business name, I remember the pig who was at my dad's house and I thought that's perfect, Petunia. Lisa adapted her mom's recipes to be gluten-free and vegan. It took her months of experimenting before she was finally ready to start selling her baked goods. I remember when I started doing this, I, I really didn't have doubt. I knew that it was going to go well and I knew that there were other people like me that had dietary restrictions or lived a different lifestyle and that there was um, a niche to fill. Petunia's Pies and Pastries started as a booth at Portland's Farmer's Market in 2009. Lisa's cowgirl cookies, pecan sticky buns, and gorgeous cupcakes immediately appealed to people with various food allergies. Every week, every day I would go set up my, do my whole setup, set up my table, my booth, and get out there and there were so many people that would come wait in line like down the whole farmer's market for 
I don't know how long. I would have people come and just be in, in tears because they haven't been able to eat like a donut for 20 years or something. Or, you know, kids come with food allergies um, and mom's crying because they can't find a cupcake for them and now they can have a cupcake. And um, that makes me emotional. <laughs> It's awesome to see that gluten-free, vegan, dairy-free, egg allergy, whatever it is, we can accommodate these people and make everyone feel special and everyone feel included and just bring joy to everybody that we can. Petunias has expanded over the last decade. They have a bakery in downtown Portland and a national wholesale business. It's a family affair to keep things running. Lisa's husband, Jacob Williamson, is a former barista. He manages all things coffee in the bakery. Her sister, Erica Clark, runs the wholesale business and the company's social media accounts. But I'm here to learn all about Lisa's innovative egg substitutes. I'm really interested to know how you landed on all of these different egg subs. How did yeah. you figure all of this out? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know how I figured it out. <laughs> Actually, I think just a lot of practice and mm -hmm. testing recipes over and over and you change one thing every time <laughs> so you end up eating a lot of like wasted pastries. <laughs> but, but eventually you arrive at this is the right mix and you find it and you keep it. On the menu today, decadent chocolate cupcakes. What are we doing first? So we're gonna make the chocolate cake batter first. We have our flour blend here right. you can put in there, which has rice flour, millet flour, tapioca flour, and flaxseed meal. Wow. And then we have our natural cocoa powder that's sifted. And then we have all of our leavenings and our salt. Whisk that. I love a whisk. <laughs> Instead of eggs, this batter stays moist thanks to a special squash, pumpkin. It's gonna give it some structure. A lot of um, gluten-free products, especially without the egg too, it can, they can dry out pretty easily, but like the pumpkin and applesauce um, help bind it together, but also they do give a lot of fluff um, and moisture, right. so it works out perfectly. Next in, organic canola oil, coconut milk, sugar, and espresso to really pump up that chocolate flavor. So now we can add the dry ingredient. This looks so amazing. I love batter. It's a struggle to get it to the pan sometimes. Oh yeah, totally. So I came prepared with oh my a spoon gosh. to taste it. Yeah, try it. As all try normal it? people do. Right. right. I love you're prepared. Right. Okay. Mmm. <laughs> look good. That Chocolatey. was good. It's crazy because you really don't even need eggs for this. You for really it to taste don't. Delicious. Yeah, you don't. That's the thing. I just there's. I feel like you really can make everything without eggs and they're just not necessary, so why not do it a different way? The batter is much thicker than a traditional cake batter, making it super easy to scoop out perfectly even portions. That looks great. Super cute. Perfect. Very yeah. fluffy. It's it a is. very fluffy batter. It is very fluffy, yeah. Why is it so fluffy? It well, I think it's just, I think we just did a really good job. We just did an amazing <laughs> job. We're gonna bake them at 350 in the oven for about 20 to 22 minutes or until um, you put a toothpick in the center and it comes out clean. Now to the most artistic part of baking, decorating. Lisa uses dairy-free butter to make super creamy frosting that also pipes well. This is our salted peanut butter buttercream, which is amazing, it's so good. This is the fun part, and you just have to not worry too much. I always say that cakes and cupcakes can smell fear, so if you're <laughs> hesitant, it's not gonna work out. You try it. I'm going really heavy. You did a great job. Am I hired? It's perfect, okay. yeah, I love it. The cupcakes are topped with melted ganache and torched marshmallows. Bubbling up. <laughs> Voila, a beautiful chocolate cupcake with a plant-based twist. Look at that. It's so Perfect. beautiful. And it I would great. literally look at this and never know that there were no eggs in this. No eggs. Oh my god. <laughs> you know what's crazy is you can't have peanuts. I can't. But I do know someone who can. Yes. Your husband Jacob. He can. Jacob, yeah. you have to come he share this with me. Loves come on. Butter. Cheers. This is insane. This is like this is honestly so delicious. <laughs> so fluffy. <laughs> it's got so much texture and flavor. Truly, if somebody gave this to me, I would have no idea that this is a plant-based vegan Good. pastry. Lisa's cupcakes are out of this world, and she says she owes it all to her biggest inspiration. 
Your mom really started your love for baking, so what does it feel like to open this bakery as a tribute and in honor of her? I know my yeah. mom sees all this, for sure. She's like guardian angel watching over us, helping me along the way, and I know that she would be so proud. Are you ready? Whether you're skipping eggs for an allergy or because you're vegan, there are so many more options now. Culinary innovation is making eggs more accessible to everyone. Well, just how are you doing? I, I know every day is different. How do you feel today? Yes, I, it's, it is the strange thing about MS. It really, it really is so variable and changes. I'm feeling really great now. I mean, I'm here with you. We're in front of a fire. I have my dog. I'm going to see my horse. I wrote a book. The book is phenomenal. I'll just say it. You are a writer, Selma Blair. Thank you. It means so much. It's hard enough to write a book. It's, it's hard, harder still to do it when you don't have all your faculties about you every day. It was the kindness of strangers who are no longer strangers, Brittany Bloom and my, my, my book agent at the book group and Julie. Um, the space they held for me and helping me and helping me type. I would send on a you know, yellow legal pad and take a picture. Be like, can you type this? And now, of course, now that the book's finished, I, I can read them right. <laughs> Just fine. Mm. <laughs> Suspicious. <laughs> I know. Funny but, how that worked. But we got through it. We got through it. And how do you feel knowing it's about to be out in the universe? I'm thrilled because when I did come out with the MS diagnosis, it really felt freeing. Um, but mostly to see that it helped other people just have a touchstone made me feel really good. It made me feel more useful. Um, I'd always get on myself, oh, you're lazy, you want to sleep. But then when I realized just at least by the act of being as honest as I could, um, it, it did something for other people and that in turn empowered me and you know it's just a whole thing of we're all in, we're all in this together. Well it's called Mean Baby. You got to explain the title. When I was just born people came over to visit the new Whitener baby. That was my last name. And they ran out of that house. These teenagers, don't go over there. The Beitners have a mean baby. <laughs> and it stuck. The things you're called, how they become part of your story, whether you mean to or not, sometimes. You write in the book about um, some very painful episodes, including um, you wrote about a teacher, an educator, who violated you. And you say, he didn't rape me, but he broke me. He broke me. I loved him. Loved him. Father figure. Having a personal betrayal of someone that loves you be so inconsiderate of your life path really hurt. It hurt me and I miss him still as a friend. Mm -hmm. The person that I had met and, and cared for as a mentor. But It feels to me you were quite courageous. I discovered wonderful things writing the book, like how much I had witnessed of friends and what I'd witnessed and what a gift that was here, and even, you know, how much I loved sharing things with people. But it wasn't until writing this book, and, and there is this mention of a rape, it was something I didn't even think of, because I think there were so many trespasses on my life, or things were cloudy with my shame, my, such a deep shame of my drinking in the past that I was talking one day to Brittany and I immediately told this after this spring break trip and then and I said but I, I, I won't I'm not gonna write that in the book and she said well maybe you want to and then I thought oh of course I have to so many people have had some similar experiences that you just 
tuck away because you think people are going to say, what did you do? And why didn't you report? And why didn't you do? Why didn't? I was a kid. I was young. And even now, it's hard to report stuff. It's hard. It's really hard. And so I put it in the book. And I even cringed as I was doing the audio book because I thought, how many more stories do I have like this that I didn't even acknowledge? Because there's so many. And I felt so sad for my body. I felt so sad. It kind of took the book and this process to even make you realize that you, you were a victim. People can take advantage. And, and then you're just too ashamed to say anything. And then you just bury it. And you bury it. You really do. And things do come back later when you're in a safer spot. But you still feel don't say you feel unsafe to say it. But I realize I am safe, and yeah, I am glad it's in the book. It's a big deal to have these things happen, and to hold that shame in your cells like it's you, like it's all you are, is someone that's not worth helping on the side of the road. That you're worth someone to say. She's nothing. I'll never see her again. She's probably passed out the whole night. <laughs> you know, mm. well, the body remembers. The body remembers. And I want it to remember some love. I want it to remember this day. I want to remember this pink sweater and this dog and my son. I want to remember. I want to remember all the things. I want other people to, too. Don't be so indignant, because we can't all have our ways. Let's move forward and help each other. Yeah. Sometimes when horrible things happen, people, the shame cycle is so big. And I wanted to say, there is no real room for guilt in moving forward. There isn't. There's not much I feel ashamed of anymore, because it just happened and I did it, or someone did it to me, and I'm, I'm okay now. But things will keep happening, and I'll keep having to figure out how to rise above. And in some ways, it's that um, frame of mind that helped you finally get rid of alcohol and kick alcohol out of your life. How did you finally conquer it? What made the difference for you? It was only self-medicating and it wasn't working anymore. And when there was public humiliation and I owned it, it there's no going back. I mean, now that I was a mother, it just changed everything. I think that's incredibly inspiring. When you've made mistakes, you own them, and you turn the page, and you smile and go forward. You do what you can to make it right for those affected and yourself. And it's important that you acknowledge, really acknowledge, and, and nothing's gonna help by still beating yourself up. You write in the book, I desperately love a story. We all have one. I carry mine inside me. You carry yours inside you. I can hear mine now in my own voice, strong and clear. What's your story? My story is that people would say to me, and I would roll my eyes when they'd say, don't give up before the miracle. Don't d commit suicide. Because I really was. I could not picture living long. But I think that my story really is that I am figuring it out now and I am kind to myself and I really do, really do have the capability to love. You're not the mean baby. I'm not the mean baby. I mean, we all can be a mean baby sometimes. Well, she needs to come out sometimes. I mean, for sure. get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the pact 
act. If you're like, Kelly, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are I was trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Let's talk about your mom. It struck me that she was extraordinarily complex, glamorous, and beautiful, and dynamic, and also emotionally elusive to you at times, and sometimes cruel. I mean, I still adore my mother. She's the most important. My sisters, we cherish her, adore her. She's on a pedestal. But no, she was not a cuddly woman. She was a role model. She was a judge. She was a million things. Um, but her idea of me was not going to be met. With, with what I was, I guess. I find it is so universal that we adore our parent so much, but, it, but it's complicated. I felt how torn you could be about your mom, who you clearly adored, and she adored you. And yet, there were stories that you reveal in the book that are kind of jaw-dropping. It's hard, because when you grow up with someone like that, you don't realize, because I'm a little like her, too. <laughs> You know, so you don't realize how, like, outlandish some things can seem when someone's kind of eccentric. Yeah. But my son said it to me. Um, I, I told him, you know, my mother, she was so critical by nature. And he's like, like you. And I'm like, oh, I am, but I think you're perfect. He's like, all you do is nag at me. Oh, wow. Like, that's my kind of love language, thinking I could pick apart someone to make them better or something. I was really struck by it when you were a little girl. One of the first things you learned is your mom saying, I wasn't sure when I was pregnant with my last baby that I really wanted to have a baby. But you know, in her defense to say, I didn't want you, it wasn't meant to be hateful. She meant it to say, oh, that would have been such a mistake to get rid of you. Thank God I have baby Blair. What was it like to grow up in that house? I felt like dying growing up. I mean, I did. And that's why I feel like I'm such a miracle right now <laughs> that I actually want to live. I want to be here. I want to enjoy this. I was so confused and lost and terrified. I was a terrified baby. And your mom would introduce you as, and this is Blair this is or Blair, Selma. This is Blair, Selma, you both. I went by both. This is Selma. This is the manic depressive. I have never been diagnosed with mania or de depression tongues. <laughs> That's mania a label to put on a little kid. But, you know, it's dramatic. I think she meant it as a badge of honor. Like, I don't suffer fools. Like, we got real problems here. My kid, my kid's very grounded. She's very deep and disturbed. You know, I think that she felt it out of gravity. Why were you so scared as a little girl? Who wouldn't be? Look at where we are. It's so weird. <laughs> and then you know you're going to die one day, and your mother's going to die, and your sisters. I mean, it's terrifying to be a child and so readily be able to explore uh, the scarier things in life. Yeah. It was a preoccupation. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that drinking uh, probably really cemented that mm -hmm. um, feeling in me. You started, you had your first drink when you were a little girl, seven years old. Yeah, my first drunk when I was seven. I had my first drinks, you know, much younger. Can you tell me about that? I thought it was God, it was at Passover Seder's. Uh, that I had my first drinks, and I always thought that was God. And then when I realized it wasn't, I was like, how convenient. <laughs> it's in a bottle. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's even as a little kid, you're like, that's a comfort. So you started at seven, you drank through elementary school, middle school, high school, college. college. How did you do it? I mean, how did you function? I don't know how I did it. I do, it all makes sense why I was so exhausted. But it was, it was hard. I, I don't know, but maybe it was easier. Maybe I would have never survived without a drink. How did it relieve your pain and your fears? Transitions have always been hard for me, and the MS made that very evident. Um, so the drinking would, it, it made me feel warm and comfortable and part of people on this earth. 
You had a lot of physical ailments since you were a little girl. I mean, you tell the story about telling your mom your leg hurt. She's like, cut it out, so my girl. I mean, I was made fun of my whole life for that leg. You and I'm like, this leg? <laughs> and it was, this leg? It was leg that I leg. I can't feel. Yeah, it was. And it, you had a fever for three years. I did. It was a big deal. I mean, doctors thought I had leukemia. We didn't know I didn't. I didn't, but it was, I had a constant high fever. I had so many things that were so indicative of MS growing and optical neuritis young and losing my vision for good. Do you feel, when you look at those physical ailments as a child, do you think, have you ever been told that probably was the beginning of MS? Or that oh, absolutely. Somehow connected? Absolutely the ailments as a kid connected. I don't know if I really did have juvenile MS at like six when we noticed my eye was first going or movements, but I do know for sure I had it by the age of 23 and it was definitely there for so long. And the pain is still there. I'm in remission. I built no new lesions, but I still have the, you know, some brain damage and things that are there, but I'm okay with it. It's I'm okay, I'm grateful, because I'm doing so much better. The general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Let's talk about your MS diagnosis. How do you feel about the fact that it took so long to get a proper diagnosis? It never occurred to me. It never occurred to me to have a neurological illness. It was the onset of MS, which was just a symptom of a really unhealthy immune system. I thought I had a million things that weren't what they were. And I would have been a lot kinder to myself if I didn't feel the need to self-medicate or check out or get through. I mean, I wasn't always checking out. I was really trying to be as capable as I could be, and I had no idea, and I was really cruel to myself. I treated myself like garbage. And the medical community sometimes was saying, maybe it's in your mind. It's like, oh, you're fine, you're dramatic, you're talkative, you're... But I would say, I am so tired, I can't move, and this has, hap this has been going on for 20 years. Even that doctor that diagnosed me, he was saying this might be functional, emotional, what traumas happen. And I fell asleep in his office, and he said to my boyfriend at the time, What's she doing? And he's like, oh, she falls asleep everywhere. And he's like, oh, wait, stand up. Put your arms out. Shut your eyes. Plank. Fell over. Like, had no idea of proprioception. I didn't know I had proprioception issues. I didn't know that my vision was a hallway. Because if you've had it your whole life, you just think that's how everyone is. It was, the, it was mind blowing to realize there was a diagnosis for this and that other people have it and don't know. And I don't mean to be tough on the doctors, but you really, you really got to do better for the women. You have to do better for all of us in diagnosing these things. You didn't have to come 
out publicly, you didn't have to share your journey. Why did you make that choice? I hadn't worked for years because I had been so sick and I, it was kind of flaring because worse because I was going back to work. I was getting on planes, the planes make it worse. I was falling apart in the airport. I couldn't get out of the fetal position or else my body would spasm. And I was getting vertigo all the time. And, and the doctor even said, with the best intentions, don't tell people. Like, just don't, we're gonna get this under control. But because I had such a bad reaction to the first treatment, it made it so much worse. I was really um, having a lot of movement and speech difficulties that were exacerbated by the prednisone. It just kept getting worse as the diagnosis went on. So it was, so the stem cell really helped, but coming out and talking about it, the story would be told anyhow. So I wanted to gain control of that. And I didn't realize how empowering it would be and how empowered I would be to then tell the truth forevermore after that. What did you think when you started seeing the reaction? I was so touched and I felt so thrilled. Oh, this is what it is to just be a human and show up. Mm -hmm. And to think that there's even a moment that I could have com comforted someone or given them an option or think about maybe if stem cells right for them. I'm really, really happy to be able to walk into this space of empowerment and realizing I, I am a calm and stable grown up. I'm okay. <laughs> even though I've not always been. You had a big night at the Vanity Fair party. That was your first night coming out since your diagnosis. What did it take to do it, and what did it mean to you to be there? I had no idea how much it would mean to show up trying to look my best in a really aggressive flare, and that was a real coming out party for me because I know it meant something to other people and certainly to people with more radical disabilities to see an in, you know? Oh right, this world is ours too. You might not see the ramp there on the stage, but there's people coming to use it and I'm gonna be one of them. I remember our moment meeting. And I loved you so much and you were such a girl. You were such a sister to me. And we were in the bathroom and I felt really nervous and you really took my hand. I had the cane, I had the dress, but everyone scurried away as they should and you stayed. I was overwhelmed that night and it was hard. I was afraid that I would vomit. That used to happen out of nowhere. I was afraid I'd trip and ruin the dress. Just really very real things of, oh my God, I'm not in the same body. And I just cried because of gratitude, but also I don't know if I can get through this night. Yeah, it's courageous. You wrote that you never practiced the Oscar speech in front of a mirror, that you never really had those leading lady aspirations. No. Why not? I never felt I was I was the one leading the pack here, and I was very comfortable to witness the greats and be a part of it. But I dare say, I, I'd probably chase that leading lady role a little, chase that leading lady role a little harder now. <laughs> but I didn't have it in me before. I didn't want to. Well, maybe you I didn't will. even want to, but maybe I will one day. Maybe it will be there for me. I mean, I'm improving on all the ways, but consistency is really key on a set and the energy and certain triggers will make my body do different things. And I'm not embarrassed of it, but I don't want to take people's time. But yet I would like to, I saw Christine Applegate, you know, she did the last season of Dead to Me and she was really dealing with a lot of health, major health challenges and watching her do it, that was an inspiration. So it's like, okay, if I were ever be able to go back to work, I'd want it to be incredible. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. Love you too. <laughs> Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. 
if you're like Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. That brings us to the documentary because the documentary really tells the story. When I watched the documentary, the word that I thought of was fearless. You were fearless. I'm so sorry, I can't talk right now. We're shooting the final days of my life. You showed it all. Yeah. Why did you want to do that? Because what I was going through with MS looked nothing like, I just couldn't find it. Jen Brea, she did a documentary I saw called Unrest. She had like an inflammatory, like there was an encephalitis issue and very similar to what I was going through. And I thought, I can't believe a woman is showing this and not afraid someone's gonna put her in a straitjacket. And if you say too much, they think you're a mental patient. The doctor would tell me, you're just dehydrated. <sighs> Everyone gets stressed. I was always so afraid of losing credibility. And so she gave me permission. That documentary of opening her life made me feel like I had permission to also have that impact for someone. So I've had a mess many years. I had a very late diagnosis. I've had it at least 25 years, at least. So I had enough, there was any embarrassment I could get over. But if there's someone else that it would move the needle for them to have some agency in their life and to trust themselves, no matter how odd or dramatic or nothing their symptoms might be from day to day. Because this is the stuff I was afraid of. Let's talk about Arthur, that sweet boy. In a way, the documentary was for him. Why did you want him to see this someday? Has he seen it? He has seen it, finally. He went to the premiere. He, he is. He's like, it wasn't that boring. Thanks. He liked it. When I was going to do stem cell, I thought because I felt so physically and emotionally so awful and drained that I did think there's a chance I won't make it. And so I did want that to be to him knowing that if I did go because my body had given out, that I wanted him to know that I really wanted to be here with him. I really wanted to take the, the steps that it took to be here. Because I was really one of those people that was like, no way, even if I have cancer, I'll never do chemo. That's just the worst thing for your body. I had a real feeling about that. And then when I felt the chemo and I felt better, it's like, okay, just let go of what you're thinking and just try and feel better for your son. But yeah, you can die. I thought if anyone would die, it would be me in that moment because I just was so, I was just so tired. Oh. So I did it for him really um, to just say, I, I did want to communicate with you. You're too young to really care now and I don't tell you, but I, I want you to know you're the, last, you're the first thing on my mind and the last thing on my mind. You, you fought to still be here. Yeah. And with I'm everything you've really got. Well. I really did, and I know we, we all will come to times where we're gonna have to fight harder than we think, and, and I was supported, I was lucky. What do you hope he sees when he sees you moving through the world? I hope he sees that when you have something that could potentially be a real setback, in time, it might not happen right away, but in time, set yourself up to recover, you know? And, I don't want him to feel ashamed or too scared that he can't move forward. I am so grateful that I'm moving forward because I did not want to my whole life. I wanted to figure out how to die with the least pain possible. <laughs> and I don't now. What kind of mom do you think you are? Embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I talk too much to strangers. But I think I am fun. He loves that I'm willing. If he wakes me up in the middle of the night and he can't sleep, it's like, okay, let's go find an adventure. Like for an hour and then we'll go back to bed. There's things that I see that I was scared of that he doesn't have at all. Mm -hmm. I give him, he does not want the effusive love that I craved from my mother. So he'll have his own memoir about how I 
you know, tried to kiss him too much. But I, I, I give him, I give him tons of space. I can really see him as his own person. But I love, I love that I'm the person he he comes to, that he trusts the most. You went and saw a psychic or a fortune teller, and this person told you you're going to be an advocate. It was Tyler Henry. And I was like, is there anything in my future? And he's like, I don't really see you acting. <laughs> and I was like, cut the tapes, guys. <laughs> I want people to think. You know, but I had been really sick for a long time. And he, he did say, I see you being an advocate. I never saw in a million years that I would be an advocate of let's calm, regroup, and figure out how to move forward. And I'm here. Your inspiration comes from overcoming, whether it's MS or addiction, yeah. or abuse, or hardship, or it's and overcoming. It's such a relief to give myself permission to say it's okay. No matter what, the guilt doesn't move through. I have to realize that. It's okay to so be light. So it's not that I'm being cocky of yes. saying like, oh, forgive myself for these things, but truthfully, you're not gonna help anyone else until you've forgiven yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there, everyone, on this fine Monday. Thanks for starting your week off right with Pop Start Plus. I'm Joe Fryer in for Carson. Today, ahead of the show, the one and only Winona Judd. She was out on the plaza and opened up about the loss of her mom, the great Naomi Judd, and the power of music. Then we'll switch gears. Any fans of the movie Halloween Town out there? One of its stars spoke to us for our flashback series and revealed what it was like to work with the legendary Debbie Reynolds. Plus, a hocus pocus moment we could not pass up. Bette Midler from our vault in 1993. But first, Carson has today's pop star. Uh, guys, let's get to Taylor Swift because there's a lot to talk about. In case you somehow missed it, the chart topper released our highly anticipated Midnight's album on Friday and dropped a music video for the lead single, track three on the record, is called Anti Hero. Here's a little bit. It's me. Taylor doesn't, didn't do any interviews for this record, but this is the song. Yeah. This is the one. This is an anthem of self-loathing. This is mm. all of her insecurities. Everything she can't stand about herself is lyrically in this. Oh, wow. One of the lyrics wow. in this song Tell is, me. Midnights become my afternoons when my depression works the graveyard shift. All the people I've ghosted stand there in the room. Oh, wow. Ooh, Think that's about a good that. lyric. Yeah, that's the lyric to that one. Wow. Uh, so she broke all the Spotify records that you can imagine. Before the album even hit the 24-hour, Midnights became the most streamed album in a single day. Taylor broke the record for most streamed artists in a single day also in Spotify history. Plus, according to Billboard, the new music has already achieved the largest sales week of any album in the last five years. You can buy it on any format, digital, vinyl, cassette, eight track for Uncle Al. Right, thank you. Now we just need to wait for the Swifties to finish decoding <laughs> the record. Next up, Beyonce. We promised two big stars. Well, you got it. Pack your bags if you're a Beehive fan because the queen is going on tour, dropping the big news during her mom, Tina Lawson's annual wearable art gala over the weekend as part of the star-studded event Guests were invited to participate in an auction where one of the surprising items up for grabs was a package to see Beyonce's 2023 Renaissance World Tour. Photos from inside the event revealed the shows are set to get kicked off this summer. Plus, whoever the lucky high bidder was at the event also won a backstage tour at one of the concerts from Miss Tina herself. Pretty big item up for auction there. Next up, Back to the Future. A new teaser is out for the upcoming Broadway show based on the beloved movies. It shows a sneak peek at how someone from the original cast is giving the new crew some tips on time travel. I don't know. A used car, huh? Looks like it's got about three million miles on it and all this stainless steel. Great, Scott. Can this thing really do 88? Trust me. <laughs> all right, I'll take it for a test drive. It's the Winter Garden Theater on Broadway. I'll be back in no time. I doubt it. I think you're going to be at the Winter Garden for a long time. Uh, I can watch those two in a sitcom. Yeah. Of course, that's the original Doc Brown, Christopher yes. Lloyd, alongside Tony winner Roger Bart, yes. Al, 
who did the, played that role on yeah. uh, in London. In London, yeah. London's West End, and they're going to be opening it here in August, which I cool. I, I cannot wait to see that either. I, I'm so excited. In fact, the soundtrack is on Spotify right now. <laughs> of course. It's terrific. What? If Roger Bart ever needs an understudy, if he gets fish point, yeah. we should mention we, we know who to call for that. Yes. Well, that's right. Uh, 88 miles per hour. Uh, yeah. 1.7 gigawatts. 1.7 gigawatts. Oh, my God. You can do it. That's you right. If I get Dylan that. to be a Martin McFly, we'd be set. Oh, that's going to be fun. Finally, our friend Mandy Moore. Congratulations in order to Mandy and Taylor, her husband, who have welcomed baby number two. Over the weekend, the couple sharing a peek at newborn Oscar Ozzy mm. Bennett Goldsmith. Aww. Mandy, uh, feeling great, revealed the little guy showed up a little later than expected. Okay. Easy delivery. She wrote on Instagram, he is beyond words, and we are so grateful for our family of four. Big congratulations to our friend Mandy Sweet. and Taylor. Sweet. And Gus is a big brother now. Oh, okay. big promotion. Great. You know, I've known Mandy since she was like a kid, 13 yeah. on TRL. Wow. Wow. It's been so fun to watch front row the benchmarks of her life. Yeah, I know. What a lovely lady, yeah. and I'm so happy yeah. for her. Us yeah. too. We love her. All yes. her dreams coming yep. true. Yep. Now to the reason we call this show Pop Start Plus, we have even more headlines for you. First up, Jay Leno. The former Tonight Show host is back with another season of Jay Leno's Garage. And in this week's episode, he has a very special guest stopping by for a drive. President Joe Biden. The two chat about the future of cars while riding around in a converted 1978 Ford F-150. Take a peek. What do you think of this idea? I think this is incredible. Taking I, old cars and retrofitting. I, no, I, I really do. It's a new hot rod. In. If you just got in this and drove and didn't know it was electric, would you know right away? Does it feel different to you? It feels different three ways. One, it's quiet. Right. Quiet as hell. Number two, if I accidentally hit it quickly, look at that. Oh, yeah, yeah, it goes good. You know what I mean? It goes good. We just laid rubber. Let me know when you're doing that so I don't bang my head again. <laughs> okay. Third thing is, Everything seems to me to be a quicker response. Right. This is the only time you get to drive, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a God's <laughs> truth. And you can catch more from their drive Wednesday at 10 p.m. on CNBC. Finally, Kenny Chesney. You can now call the leader of No Shoes Nation, Dr. Chesney. Over the weekend, East Tennessee State University awarded the country music superstar with an honorary doctorate for his commitment to the future of country and bluegrass music. Chesney graduated from ETSU in 1990, where he was a member of the school's bluegrass program. He opened up about the major milestone on Instagram writing. I was also able to reconnect with the man who taught me how to play guitar when I was in college. It felt so great to be back. Congrats, Dr. Chesney. And that's the latest for you today. Coming up, country star Winona Judd's visit to our plaza. Stay with us. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. The general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We are back here on Pop Start Plus. The country music world lost Naomi Judd back in April. And during a visit to the plaza, her daughter Winona opened up about her mother's legacy and how creating new music has helped her heal. Country music legend. Winona Judd, the oh, Grammy so. winner, come on girl, oh, come has on. been making music for decades. And of course, 
her mom, Naomi, took the world by storm. Those two together performing mm -hmm. as the Judds. And now as Winona works to process the loss of her mom, she's back on stage using her beloved music to heal. Let's take a look. Winona Judd paying tribute to her mother, Naomi, performing their classic, River of Time, at a celebration of Naomi's life two weeks after her passing. Mama, he's crazy. The mother-daughter duo launched their careers in the early 80s, going on to win five Grammys and topping the charts dozens of times, solidifying their place in music history. Love is love and it's but the road to the top of country music was not an easy one. Naomi often spoke out on her struggle with mental health issues, opening up on today in 2017. You're down to this deep, dark hole of depression and you really don't think that there's another minute. The Judds reunited on stage for what would be their final live performance at the Country Music Television Awards just weeks before Naomi's death. Then on May 1st, the day after Naomi's passing, the Judds were inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. I feel so blessed and it's a very strange dynamic to be this broken and this blessed. Naomi and Winona had scheduled a final concert tour this fall, but after Naomi's passing, Winona is now hitting the road alone, saying it was what her mother would have wanted, celebrating their honor and her legacy. Winona Judd, welcome back. We're so happy you're here. Can I just pause for one second, just to comment on what you just said right there? after you guys were inducted into the Hall of Fame, you said you were both broken and blessed. How, how are you feeling today? I'm writing a song called Broken and Blessed, and I wasn't gonna cry, but I love you and have known you so long. I'm somewhere between hell and hallelujah. <laughs> and these shows are healing me one show at a time, and all mm -hmm. my friends are coming, and it's like the greatest party you throw yourself before the end. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a victory lap and the fans are watching me, and they're for me because they grew up with me. Mm -hmm. I've been around that long. Mm. And they're bringing their next generation sisters, and I'm seeing up to four generations at the shows. It's mm. a crazy time, Hoda, because it's not about show business. This is a celebration of life, mm. as well as people going through their own stuff while listening to the songs of what they went through. You had originally, this was originally a tour for you and your mom. Mm -hmm. um, if not for this tour, where do you think you would be? I would be at home planning my next big moment. Mm. You know, you sit at home during the pandemic and you talk about what you're gonna do and you can go back out. That's what we do, we go home. <laughs> and like with your kids, you play mm -hmm. in your home and your family mm -hmm. and then you think, what's my next big moment? Because yeah. that's what we live for, that's what we work for. Um, Pain comes in waves. I've, whenever I've suffered a loss, I, sometimes it comes like a tidal wave and sometimes it's calm and you almost forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What part of that place are you in? It depends on what state I'm in and what state I'm mm -hmm. in. <laughs> I will cry and then go right into the next song and I mm -hmm. keep Kleenex right here did at you, all times. Your mom used to do that, didn't she? Uh -huh. <laughs> How did you know I that? You know why I remember? Because when she, she's been here many yes, times, she had a couple of things that she would stash away in there. I just sing and I cry and I do the same thing every day where I'm at. People know me really well. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know me, check me out. Uh, I'm fun <laughs> and I'm real and I'm broken and I'm blessed and I'm sassy, you know, and I'm crying and snotting through the songs. But thousands of people are showing up to celebrate with me. Of course. Me. Who's your rock through this? My granddaughter, Kalia, she's six months old and she doesn't speak yet, but she looks right through me and I know you know what I'm talking about. They look right through you. What does she give you that no one she else She gives can? me hope. She gives me hope. Your daughter's name is Hope. One oh of your, God. yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know that, they give you hope. They give you something to think about other than yourself. Because mm -hmm. so much of what we do is about us. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be with her because she doesn't care what I look like. <laughs> Have you, um, like, I don't know if the word is, how are you coping with, with the way your mom passed? Or have you have I you have a grief it? counselor and a life coach. And yeah. I call them and I say, I'm, I don't understand why. And they'll say, ask yourself what? What can you do? Huh. 
it, they helped shift me over into another lane and they helped me to go, I can do something, even though I feel hopeless right now. I can do Instead something. of asking why, mm -hmm. ask what. What mm -hmm. can I do right this minute to get to the next breath, to the next right thing? Can I talk about the sisterhood that's around you? You've got Martina, who's going to be performing with you today. You've got Trisha Yearwood, little, all Thank these. You. Uh, I mean, you have an incredible group of singers mm -hmm. who are all mm -hmm. surrounding you. Yes. I mean, what does that feel like for it's you? It's incredibly overwhelming too much. It's like at a funeral when you have your entire family there, mm -hmm. and yet you wouldn't have it any other way, mm -hmm. even though it's, it's the hardest thing to do sometimes is just to be present and do the next thing that you're doing and they're there to support country music as a community well you also have additional tour dates that you are adding because everybody wants your ooh, ticket ooh. girl everybody everybody can go. wants it everybody can where go are they now. going the judds.com will tell you what the next 15 shows are going to be the judds.com because you needed more days because everywhere you went people are selling as out. of today yeah the the tickets are on sale i i just found this out like a week ago they said we're adding more shows and i said okay <laughs> what am i going to do yeah. hoda sit at home yeah. and complain yeah uh, 15 more mm -hmm. shows. Uh, you can get yours now. Good. So. It's, it's a city concert pre-sale. We're happy to be uh, linking arms with you on this, and we love you so mm. much. You've been there for a long time. Oh, I love you. Amazing to have Winona with us. Coming up here on Pop Star Plus, we're taking a trip to Halloween Town with the beloved movie star. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Open your eyes, you get to decide. How's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day. Lighten your load every single morning. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Certain movies are inextricably tied to Halloween, like the beloved Halloween Town. The film featured Debbie Reynolds as a witch and grandmother to Marnie, played by Kimberly J. Brown. For our flashback series, Kimberly spoke to R. Donna Farrison about her memories from the set. Kimberly, I feel like I'm living out a fall play date right now. <laughs> My childhood play dates were watching <laughs> you. I'm thinking about the Disney Channel voiceover, Halloween Town, starring Kimberly J. Brown and Debbie Reynolds. Take me back to a little bit of that time when you were younger. When you auditioned for this role of Marnie, you starred in the first Halloween Town when you were 13. What was the process like auditioning at that young age and then getting the role? I think I did two rounds of auditions. I just loved Marnie so much. She was so courageous and determined. 
I really admired her in a way. If that's possible with characters, and I was so excited when I found out that I had gotten it. Roles like that didn't come along all the time, like to be able to kind of play a you know, teenage witch, really. I feel like it's almost more common than it was back then. I was thrilled. You say you admire her. How would you describe Marnie's character? I think Marnie, you know, she was trying to figure out who she was at 13. Okay, I'm practically a grown up. I'm certainly old enough to make my own choices. She had so much courage and determination and really took a lot of risks and just kept moving forward without even being sure of like what was gonna happen next. And so many young girls look up to her then, but also now people are starting to watch this movie for the first time. How does that make you feel not only knowing that, you know, it's sort of become a Halloween cult classic, but also garnering this new demographic of fans too? All aboard for the Mortal World! It's incredible. It really blows my mind. I meet multiple generations of fans. I meet grandma and her daughter and then her young daughter who are all watching it. It's just amazing. It's gone way beyond our wildest expectations when we first shot the first one. I'm so grateful to the fans because they have really just given it this whole life and over social media and now with Disney Plus, young kids are watching it. So it's really just incredible. I'm so honored that people still love it. This is Halloween Town, just like the book. Uh, or maybe we fell asleep on the bus. Yeah, that's it. It's all a dream. Decorations, the goblins, the witches, the ghosts. And Grandma, she was a dream too. I love that you mentioned that this movie is for all different generations, from the grandmother to the mother to the daughter. And I feel that that's what was echoed on screen as well with you, with Judith, with Debbie Reynolds. What was that relationship like to work with the legendary Debbie Reynolds? That is pretty incredible. And also at such a young age, was there anything that she caught you or said that sort of shaped you? Oh, absolutely. And that's just the way they use their magic. She was just incredibly kind and treated all of us kids as peers right from the very start. She looked out for every actor, every crew member on set. She loved telling stories and jokes about her life and making you laugh at her expense was always one of her favorite things. But over the years, I think Marnie and Aggie's relationship very much mirrored what Kimberly and, and Debbie's relationship was. And there's so much of just getting to be around such a legend and just such an amazing human being that will just always stay with me. Was there a specific scene you remember being sort of the most awestruck by? I think in the first Halloween Town, flying on the broom with, with Debbie was a really special scene and day for me. It was our last day of shooting and it was, we spent the entire afternoon up on a big stool in front of a blue screen. And that was like my first day of just one-on-one -on -one time with her. And so it was so special for that reason but it was so exciting to, to see it afterwards and go, oh my gosh, look, we look like we're flying. Oh my okay, now I have to get to the good stuff. Can you tell me a little bit about your love story with your fiance, Daniel Kuntz, and just what is in the secret sauce of <laughs> her, her co-stars who then meet up later in life and get together? It's completely unexpected. Um, people ask us like, oh, well, you know, you must have known something while you're filming or had some, you know, had crushes or something. And that was absolutely not the case. Your only power was the power to keep us apart, Cal. And now you don't have that power anymore. I think it had been at least 10 or 15 years since we had seen each other. We had stayed social media friends for a bit and I was filming some new sketches for my YouTube channel. Were we dating during Halloween Town 2? <laughs> and that is a big uh, no. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> for many reasons, but that was a long time ago. I thought it would be fun to have come have him do some because the fans, you know, would love it. And so I reached out and we ended up getting together and, and catching up and just through the course of that kind of started realizing we started getting feelings for each other. And it was like, oh, wow, this is unexpected. When we finally went public with it, it was it's been so fun over the years just to watch all the fans. <laughs> reactions. Most of them warned me, you know, to continue to hide my spell book and, you know, that he's, he probably is, you know, there's probably something else going on. It's been so much fun to, uh, to, you know, see the, the fans' reactions to it all. I think that Halloween at your guys' house would be awesome. It's <laughs> definitely extra special holiday now, considering uh, just our lives, our relationship, everything. It's amazing how it's all come together that, um, 
is it, and I was gonna say art imitated life. I guess it's life imitating art in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you hope that people take away from the movie and from the spirit of Halloween? I hope that they take away that embracing yourself is so much more important than what other people think. I think that was always the common message throughout all the Halloween Town movies. And that is the the great magical aspect of Halloween Town in the sense that they celebrate Halloween. It's Halloween every day, but also everybody is is loved and cherished for exactly who they are. And I think that's why Marnie takes to it so quickly and all of the Cromwell kids do, but I think that's just so important, especially now that kids and even adults, you know, that we all get reminded yeah. of that. We can all use a little bit of Marnie's spirit. Absolutely. Thanks, kids. See you in the afterlife. So terrific to hear from Kimberly. Coming up, another Halloween classic, Hocus Pocus. We found a great clip from our vault with Bette Midler. Stay with us. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, Good morning. Welcome to today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day, we start our morning so you can take on yours. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. You've probably heard a mention or two of a little movie called Hocus Pocus this time of year. Well, we found a clip from our vault with the legendary Bette Midler as the first film was being released back in 1993. Well, I watched you all running around doing your thing. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you ever burst out laughing because it's it, if I were one of you, that's what I would have done. I mean, were you <laughs> we did. to do that? Well, we did. We laughed when we felt we had hit it. You know, we would we would get uh, we got a lot of satisfaction out of really nailing the the little bit that we had set out to do, and uh, I laughed all the time. I was always like, "Girl, you are so funny." <laughs> <laughs> To Kathy or to Sarah or to me, myself. Uh, uh, Sarah Jessica and, and Sarah Kathy. Jessica, my good friend Sarah Jessica and Kathy, absolutely adore you, idolize you. Uh -huh. Were you able to, to help them and teach them? Well, I didn't know that they idolized well, me. Well, Kathy, Jimmy I, said that you, you were on top of her Christmas tree. She was a, it turned out that Kathy, Kathy and Jimmy was an old fan of mine and that she had come looking for me once when I lived on Barrel Street in New York City. And she had left a, her, 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 uh, left a letter and a picture for me or something like that. And she reminded me of all this. And of course, I, I, I had to say, Kathy, I, I, I was unaware at the time. <laughs> but she took it well. And Sarah Jessica was uh, a different kind of a fan. But um, she was an Annie, right? She was and an Annie. She, she and you all had the fabulous. same music coach or voice Turned out teacher we had the whatever. same voice teacher. And uh, I, we were singing, we were singing that song, um, uh, I Put a Spell on You, and I walked into the studio, and they had their microphone, and of course I had my microphone, because they were singing the background parts. Well, I, I started to sing, and I looked over at them, and, and their little knees were like, they, they had, <laughs> they were totally freaked out. And they, said, and they came to me afterwards and said, we couldn't believe we were standing there singing with you. And That's right. They were the, the back, I was very touched the by the backup it. girls, the right? The backup girls. They did a great job. Yeah. 
How was it uh, flying? Did you feel a little like Peter Pan? Was that a blast? Uh, it, I can't say it was a blast. It hurt like hell. You know, the thing about the broom was you had to find out, you had to figure out how to, you know, keep it, between, uh, forgive me, keep it between your legs and fly and do all this stuff at the same time. And it took us a, a, a few weeks to figure, because it, it hurt so bad. It put a lot of strain on your back muscles. In fact, I, you had I, to go to a chiropractor yeah, after I this wrenched, film. I wrenched a, something here, a trapezius or something, and I, I, never, I haven't really fully recovered. <coughs> Workman's comp. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> I liked when Kathy and Jimmy uh, flew on the Hoover vacuum cleaner. That was cleaner. great. I think that's going to be the biggest laugh in the picture. I personally uh, put my money on that laugh. It was hysterical. It was wonderful. <laughs> Is this pretty much a kid's movie, you think, that I think it has a uh, tremendous physical comedy for grown-ups and they and the grown-ups do love that but for the kids it's so it, ha it has lo lots of laughs but also has just a little bit of a terror too not terror like they usually give you but not fun, like jurassic park not like terror. jurassic park terror but uh fun terror you know where you know oh, they're just it's just but ben midler you know that sort kind of, of hansel and gretel like. As, yeah yeah and uh, I, we have very high hopes for it. But you know, hey, I've had plenty of high hopes before. <laughs> and had them dashed. So what? Nothing like a spooky and funny throwback. Okay, friends, thanks so much for being here on Pop Star Plus. Tomorrow, your guide to all the Halloween movies you should have on your watch list this week. We'll see you then. It's so Perfect. beautiful, and it I would great. literally look at this and never know that there were no eggs in this. No eggs. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Incredible edible eggs really are, well, pretty incredible. From a simple hard-boiled egg to a stunning souffle, eggs are essential parts of so many meals. They give great lift to pastry, make dishes super decadent, and they're also just delicious on their own. But how do you replace them in a plant-based diet? I'm going on a cross-country hunt to find out how chefs are cooking up savory meals and sweets, all without cracking a single egg. Right now, it's breakfast time. So I'm headed to a local spot right here in Brooklyn that's turning chickpea flour into a breakfast staple, the perfect scramble. Hi, Sama. Amanda. Nice, nice to meet you. Amanda. Nice to meet you, Cheyenne. Cheyenne, nice to meet you. So excited to be here. Should yeah. we get inside? Let's do it. Let's, Let's go. go. Awesome. Cheyenne Willis and Amanda Fox own and operate Satan's Helper in Brooklyn, New York. The couple, who wed in 2016, dish up vegan twists on classic New York City deli dishes. Their specialty? Remaking breakfast staples with a variety of plant-based eggs. A lot of people, when they go plant-based or they try and start eating a more vegan diet, right? Mm -hmm. Eggs are something that people seem to miss. So you do a lot of really interesting things with eggs here. And I want to know, how do you mimic the texture and the flavor of a regular egg? Tofu just is never going to be <laughs> eggs, so you just have to get <laughs> to that closeness. Yeah. So with our tofu scramble, Cheyenne uses a process of doing three different kinds of uh, tofu. So they'll do one block of tofu in cubes, so you get that like little cube aspect. They blend some aspect to make it creamy, and then some they match with their hands. So you get like a different sort of a scramble, like a creamy scramble with like little bits of bite to it. From tofu scrambles, 
to a chickpea-based omelet, there's no shortage of creative plates here. There's a lot of different avenues you can take with plant-based food, right? So why did you choose a vegan deli? We're both from Pennsylvania. We both come from like getting your sandwich from the grocery store. And it's just like a classic nostalgic feeling. I grew up cooking with my grandparents and my mom, and it was just always classic Americana food. So we decided that this would be the most natural road for us to take. Um, and this is just what came naturally to us. Amanda and Cheyenne first met during high school in Pennsylvania. A few years after graduation, they reconnected and quickly fell in love over their shared passion for cooking. We've just been always obsessed with food. Cheyenne's actually a classically trained pastry chef. The two moved to Brooklyn and worked together at several restaurants across New York City. They tied the knot at Dunwell, a vegan donut shop in Williamsburg. What is your favorite part about working with Cheyenne? We're in each other's brains, 100%. <laughs> After working in traditional restaurants, they both had dreams of creating a more equitable eatery, run with a focus on treating staff fairly. So we decided that when we made our space that it would be everybody's on the same playing field. We're all equal. It doesn't matter who technically owns it. It doesn't matter who does what or whatever. Everybody gets paid the same. We all are just here working together as a team. In 2018, Amanda and Cheyenne started running a vegan pop-up, serving homemade seitan at various locations around Brooklyn. Seitan, the restaurant's namesake, is a high-protein meat substitute made from wheat gluten. The chefs use seitan to recreate plant-based deli meats, like bacon and roast beef. I think the interesting thing about our food is we base it on those flavors that you're so used to. So when we were coming up with our salami recipe, I was like, okay, so what goes into actual salami? And we took those ideas and those flavors, so it became the base for this nostalgic food that we can now make vegan. After a successful run, the pop-up graduated to a storefront in 2020. Putting down roots in a permanent location was vital for the couple, who wanted to create an inclusive space for vegan and queer communities. We get to meet so many different types of people, and obviously because we're a queer-owned company, we attract all the queers, which is perfect with me. We have our loyal customers that have been with us from the jump. The same person who ordered from my very first pop-up came in the other day. I was certainly ready for my breakfast sandwich. Cheyenne took me into the kitchen to make a Satan's Helper signature. All right, so what are we making first, so Cheyenne? So we're gonna start with the nomlets, our chickpea flour-based egg. You say nomlet? Nomlet, Like yes. nom nom. Absolutely. I love that. Yes. <laughs> so we're gonna start with some chickpea flour here. Okay. To make a perfect nomlet, building the right eggy texture is key. Cheyenne mixes oat milk, lemon juice, and oil with chickpea flour, or besan, a common ingredient in Indian cuisine. Have you tested this with other flours, or have you landed on chickpea flour being the best for I an eggy? I definitely try with regular flour, but it is weird. So that's why we use the chickpea, just okay. keep it like lighter, fluffier, okay. less harsh. It looks really nice, it smells good already. Yeah. A few simple spices amp up the flavor and color of the dish. A lot of spices in here to Tons. make it nice and nomlety. Yeah, <laughs> delicious. I feel that uh, a lot of times in vegan cooking, people don't add a lot of spices. Cheyenne's secret to upping the savory factor is kala namak, or Himalayan black salt, which comes from North India. It has this, so this really <laughs> wonderful um, sulfuric acid taste. It brings that egg flavor really to the that front. That egginess, yeah. 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 The nomlet cooks for about five minutes before getting a flip. Look at that. Stunning. Gorgeous. Yeah. So we'll know when she's done, when she's a little bit firm. Okay. Yeah, she's pretty much good to go. This looks really good and it smells amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. It's like, it's such, it's giving me such a savory pancake vibe, mm -hmm. even though it is also an omelet, so I love it. The omelet is served with even more plant-based breakfast staples. All right, so All right. I have our house made. The bacon. Bacon here. This is made out of seitan, I'm It assuming. is, and there's like oats and cheese, Ooh. jalapenos, a bunch of wow. fun stuff in here. We do not skimp on anything. Love that. And so I fried this up, and we're just gonna lay this gently down. Amazing. Just give it a little bit of fluff there. Love it. And then we would just close the lid up. Ta-da! A totally vegan BEC. There I go. Woo! Whoa. Whoa, Cheyenne, whoa. Lots of flavors. The omelet is crispy. The bacon is super flavorful. It's delicious. Thank you.
the eggless egg sandwich really blew me away. Now it's time for lunch, and I happen to know a fantastic ramen spot on the other side of the country. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Among the countless ramen spots out there, Ramen Hood in downtown Los Angeles is truly something special. Everything on the menu is totally vegan. Ramen Hood was co-founded by Top Chef Season 2 winner Ilan Hall and world-renowned chef Rahul Kapkar in 2015. There you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited. Ramen Hood is one of just a few restaurants in the country specializing in plant-based ramen. And they were the first to offer a vegan soft-boiled egg, a traditional topping for this comforting soup. Rahul, you yes. make vegan ramen. Can you tell me about why you do that and how this all got started? Uh, it was actually my friend's idea. I was working in Denmark at the time, and he called me and he was like, hey, I have this idea for a vegan noodle concept. That friend was Ilan, who had been running Esh, an Israeli barbecue joint in Brooklyn. Why make it vegan? <laughs> My business partner had a restaurant that was very meat heavy, and he was catching a lot of flack from vegans on Twitter. <laughs> and that is kind of, it's not like the catalyst, but he was just kind of like, all right, well, I mean, I can do vegan food. In 2014, Ilan invited Rahul to cross the Atlantic and bring his expertise from one of the world's most prestigious fine dining restaurants, Noma in Copenhagen. Part of the reason he called me was because the restaurant I was working at, we were serving, I think, like 24 courses at the time, and like 16 of them were vegetable forward. And then once we kind of started talking about it and refining it, it just made sense for us to do ramen. Ramen's something I grew up eating. It's like a real uh, kind of like comfort food for me and definitely nostalgic. I used to come home from school and have a bowl with my grandmother. Traditional ramen broth is usually made with pork, beef, or chicken bones. Sometimes it's a combo. But Ramen Hood uses vegan dashi, a liquid base made from kanbu and shiitake mushrooms. This is a spicy garlic sunflower seed broth. Uh, we've got some bean sprouts in here, baby bok choy, uh, king oyster mushrooms, scallions, sesame seeds, chili thread. After pressure cooking and blending the ingredients with sunflower seeds, the chefs are able to create a creamy, umami-rich broth without any animal protein. But Rahul thought their vegan bowls wouldn't be complete without a classic topping, a creamy, soft-boiled egg. Why was it important for you to add this vegan egg into um, this ramen? People expect an egg in ramen. It provides that creamy texture that kind of people are looking for. And in like a traditional bowl, it can be a really nice, like different thing to be eating. Like you've got chewy noodles and you've got this pork and then, you know, you've got an egg that's like a soft boiled egg. It just makes the, the broth richer and it kind of makes your entire experience eating the bowl feel richer. Ramen Hood's secret? Mixing the dashi from their ramen broth with agar, a gelatin made from seaweed. 
teach me how to make this. Yeah, this is pretty straightforward. So we're gonna take 500 grams of our broth. Okay. This is the agar here. We're just gonna put a little bit in. Dump this in here. So I'm stirring this around to make sure the agar doesn't clump and settle. Okay. And how long does it take to get to the point where you want it to be? Um, not long. It'll take just a couple minutes. After the agar mixture simmers, it's poured into a custom mold to create an egg shape. How many of these do you make a day? Uh, about 150. Within just a few minutes, the liquid firms up, and it looks and feels just like a boiled egg white. This literally tastes like... First of all, this tastes so good. It tastes like ramen broth, like a lot of umami. But also the texture is very egg white. Yeah, because it's this just the broth. It's, like, it's got the richness from the sunflower seeds. Yeah. To make a whole egg, the chef uses a melon baller to scoop out room for the yolks. That's so crazy how like gelatinous it is. Like an egg white. Okay, I'm gonna go. Don't judge me. First time. That was pretty good. That was better than most people's first try. When the egg whites are firm, it's time to fill them with the creamy yolk. It's vegan mayo with food coloring and black salt, like okay. Indian black Call salt. Yeah. yeah, so it's got the uh, egg flavor to it. Okay, yeah. cool. And you so, just pipe it in? Yeah. Here. Yeah. That's it. You just I'm go, like looking for my affirmation. Just, just go to, yeah, just do the rest of them. There you go. This jiggly, soft-boiled egg helps complete a ramen experience that hasn't been available to many vegan foodies for years. Okay, I'm going for the egg. I feel like I owe it to us to go for the egg. I think you should just one bite it. Wow, it's so good. I just, Thank I you. truly haven't had ramen in years because I mostly can't eat it anywhere. So this is revolutionary for my life. Like, this is a plot twist for me. I love it. I'm coming back. I'm bringing my parents next time. This vegan hard-boiled egg might be pretty advanced for a home chef, but I've got a super easy egg swap for baked goods that only requires two ingredients. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about, and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. The general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. If you're looking to replace eggs in your baked goods, maybe you're allergic, you're vegan, or you simply don't like eggs, a flax egg might be the substitute for you. I'm going to show you how to make two flax eggs today. So we're using two tablespoons of flaxseed meal with five tablespoons of warm water. You can see it right here. 
This is gonna blow your mind. It's super simple. Grab your flaxseed meal, add it to a bowl, clean bowl. And next, I'm just gonna add my warm water. I know, it's challenging, right? We wanna give this a nice little stir, get everything nice and incorporated. All of the flax should get in there. We're gonna let this sit aside for about five minutes until it gets nice and thick and gelatinous. After, you can use it as a sub for your eggs and your baked goods. So I'm just gonna let it hang out. It's gonna chill out, have some spa time. See you soon. Welcome back. It's been five minutes while I waited for my flax egg to do its thing. You wanna wait until it's nice and gelatinous. So that might take you a couple extra minutes, no worries. Let's check the texture. Check this out. She's thick. Gelatinous, I keep saying that word, but it's true. Flax eggs really work like eggs to help bind and thicken your baked good. It's not gonna rise exactly like eggs would, but you're not gonna taste it at all. It's still gonna be a delicious and perfectly baked, baked good. I'm not saying this belongs in a museum, but it might belong in your cookies, okay? Flaxseed isn't the only swap vegan bakers can use to replace eggs. One bakery in Portland is using all sorts of different ingredients, from applesauce to tofu, to make plant-based desserts that are totally decadent. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky, to cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. You get one beautiful so life to live. What are you gonna do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world to me. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm gonna go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the I way. love riding. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> When it comes to pastry and baked goods, eggs are pretty essential. They definitely help bind things together in baking. They provide moisture. They have some fat and protein, which just provide the structure for the baked good, you know, for it to, to rise, they give lift. So they are really hard to replace. This is Lisa Clark, the founder of Petunias, Portland's first all vegan and gluten-free bakery. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming in. She's also an expert in egg-free baking. It really depends on the product that we're making and the qualities that each egg substitute has and what you want the end result to be like. And the other ingredients that are in the recipe, you know, it has to work well with what you're making. We use a lot of coconut yogurt, which gives a lot of moisture and it helps make things a little lighter. Applesauce also does help to give moisture um, and a little bit of lift. And chia seed meal, I love, and it's very healthy for you, which is added bonus. We use this like in our chocolate chip cookie. It works really well in cookies to help bind things together and give a nice texture. This is silken tofu that's pureed with a, a milk, so you could use coconut milk, almond milk, rice milk with an immersion blender. That's really nice in like a pound cake that we make or a poppy seed muffin that we make. It helps give some structure and stability. In 2003, Lisa learned she was intolerant to dairy, gluten, and eggs. She decided to take control of her diet by turning to one of her favorite childhood hobbies. My mom is who taught me how to bake, and it's just something we did together all the time. She had ALS when I was a child, and she passed away when I was 12, uh, which was really, really hard, and so there wasn't a lot that we could 
do it together because she was so limited physically. She was in a wheelchair and I was the youngest of three and I was home with her all the time and helped take care of her. Um, and one thing she could do was just explain to me how to bake and tell me what to do. And I would have our little KitchenAid mixer and you know follow the directions and get up on my stool and do it and I loved it. And it's one thing that we could do to bond and to do something together. She had a little ceramic pig's head that hung over the stove when I was a kid and her name was Petunia the pig and so when I was trying to think of a business name I remember the pig who was at my dad's house and I thought that's perfect Petunia. Lisa adapted her mom's recipes to be gluten-free and vegan. It took her months of experimenting before she was finally ready to start selling her baked goods. I remember when I started doing this I I really didn't have doubt. I knew that it was going to go well and I knew that there were other people like me that had dietary restrictions or lived a different lifestyle and that there was um, a niche to fill. Petunia's pies and pastries started as a booth at Portland's Farmer's Market in 2009. Lisa's cowgirl cookies, pecan sticky buns, and gorgeous cupcakes immediately appealed to people with various food allergies. Every week, every day I would go set up my, do my whole setup, set up my table, my booth, and get out there and there were so many people that would come wait in line like down the whole farmer's market for I don't know how long I would have people come and just be in, in tears because they haven't been able to eat like a donut for 20 years or something or you know kids come with food allergies um, and moms crying because they can't find a cupcake for them and now they can have a cupcake and um, that makes me emotional <laughs> It's awesome to see that gluten-free, vegan, dairy-free, egg allergy, whatever it is, we can accommodate these people and make everyone feel special and everyone feel included and just bring joy to everybody that we can. Petunias has expanded over the last decade. They have a bakery in downtown Portland and a national wholesale business. It's a family affair to keep things running. Lisa's husband, Jacob Williamson, is a former barista. He manages all things coffee in the bakery. Her sister, Erica Clark, runs the wholesale business and the company's social media accounts. But I'm here to learn all about Lisa's innovative egg substitutes. I'm really interested to know how you landed on all of these different egg subs. How did yeah. you figure all of this out? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know how I figured it out. Actually, I think just a lot of practice and testing recipes over and over and you change one thing every time so you end up eating a lot of like wasted pastries. But, but eventually you arrive at this is the right mix and you find it and you keep it. On the menu today, decadent chocolate cupcakes. What are we doing first? So we're going to make the chocolate cake batter first. We have our flour blend here right. you can put in there, which has rice flour, millet flour, tapioca flour, and flaxseed meal. Wow. And then we have our natural cocoa powder that's sifted. And then we have all of our leavenings and our salt. Whisk that. I love a whisk. <laughs> Instead of eggs, this batter stays moist thanks to a special squash, pumpkin. It's going to give it some structure and a lot of um, gluten-free products, especially without the egg too, it can, they can dry out pretty easily, but like the pumpkin and applesauce um, help bind it together, but also they do give a lot of fluff um, and moisture, right. so it works out perfectly. Next in, organic canola oil, coconut milk, sugar, and espresso to really pump up that chocolate flavor. So now we can add the dry ingredient. This looks so amazing. I love batter. It's a struggle to get it to the pan sometimes. Oh yeah, totally. So I came prepared with oh a my spoon gosh. to taste it. Yeah, try it. As all try normal it? people do. Right. right. I love you're prepared. Right. Okay. Mmm. <laughs> look good. That was good. It's crazy because you really don't even need eggs for this. You for really it to taste don't. Delicious. Yeah, you don't. That's the thing. I just there's. I feel like you really can make everything without eggs and they're just not necessary, so why not do it a different way? The batter is much thicker than a traditional cake batter, making it super easy to scoop out perfectly even portions. That looks great. Super cute. Perfect. Very yeah. fluffy. It's it a is. very fluffy batter. It is very fluffy. Yeah. Why is it so fluffy? It well, I think it's just... I think we just did a really good job. We just did an amazing <laughs> job. We're gonna bake them at 350 in the oven for about 20 to 22 minutes or until um, you put a toothpick in the center and it comes out clean. 
Now to the most artistic part of baking, decorating. Lisa uses dairy-free butter to make super creamy frosting that also pipes well. This is our salted peanut butter buttercream, which is amazing. It's so good. This is the fun part, and you just have to not worry too much. I always say that cakes and cupcakes can smell fear, so if you're <laughs> hesitant, it's not gonna work out. You try it. I'm going really heavy. You did a great job. Am I hired? It's perfect, okay. yeah, I love it. The cupcakes are topped with melted ganache and torched marshmallows. Bubbling up. <laughs> Voila, a beautiful chocolate cupcake with a plant-based twist. Oh, look at that. It's perfect. so beautiful. And it I would great. literally look at this and never know that there were no eggs in this. No egg. Oh my God. <laughs> you know what's crazy is you can't have peanuts. I can't. But I do know someone who can. Yes. Your husband Jacob. He can. Jacob, yeah. you have to come he share this with me. He loves peanut butter. Cheers. Cheers. This is insane. This is like, this is honestly so delicious. <laughs> so fluffy. <laughs> it's got so much texture and flavor. Truly, if somebody gave this to me, I would have no idea that this is a plant-based vegan. Good. Lisa's cupcakes are out of this world, and she says she owes it all to her biggest inspiration. Your mom really started your love for baking, so what does it feel like to open this bakery as a tribute and in honor of her? I know my yeah. mom sees all this, for sure. She's like guardian angel watching over us, helping me along the way, and I know that she would be so proud. Are you ready? Whether you're skipping eggs for an allergy or because you're vegan, there are so many more options now. Culinary innovation is making eggs more accessible to everyone. Do you ever just look around and say, I can't believe we did this? Yes, totally. That was like the light bulb moment. I got up there and I just said I quit my job and started this company. And I just kept going. It was a lot of testing and learning. There's been a lot of tears along the way. We can actually change the world. When did you have the moment, I made it, I did it? Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of She Made It, where we highlight some amazing female founders who are shaking up their industries and turning their light bulb ideas into reality. For this half hour, I'll be telling you all about some of my favorite brands to help you look and feel your best, whether it's a cozy blanket to help us unwind or a unique way for gifting to those you love. We have got you covered. Plus, I'll reveal my She Made It It list featuring for small businesses, you'll want to shop, all from dynamic women you'll want to support. So, let's get started. First up, I want to introduce you to Birdie Lashes, founder Yasmin Maya, an influencer who went from doing makeup tutorials to launching her own beauty brand. And she has overcome some incredible challenges on her path to success. Take a look. Influencer Yasmin Maya has over 3 million followers glued to her makeup and hair tutorials. Hey my beauties, welcome back to my channel. Bienvenidas a nuevo mi canal, yo soy... At 30 years old, the wife and mom with baby number two on the way. Aww, Good baby bump. <laughs> is also behind Birdie Lashes, the brand she officially launched last December with foam ink lashes and eyeliner that doubles as adhesive. What makes your lashes so easy? Because I know a lot of people are like, okay, it's another lash and I can't ever put them on myself. Our lashes are vegan, cruelty-free. They're super ultra soft and they're very light. So you're not gonna feel them heavy. You just pop it right on top of the eyeliner and it will stay. How proud are you of yourself? I look back and it's unbelievable. Hi guys, 
Okay, welcome to my channel. Nine years ago, Yasmin started her YouTube channel, Beauty Bird. She was living alone and in limbo, not in the Southern California town where she was raised, but in her birth country. I'm going actually through a really hard time right now. Walk us through what your childhood was like and what you went through. I was born in Mexico, very poor, like almost homeless. I didn't move here to the United States until I was like a year and three months. I grew up thinking I was part of this country and it wasn't until I got to high school when my mom got deported that it hit me with the reality that I am actually an illegal immigrant. Yasmin's father, also not a U.S. citizen, was deported shortly after her graduation. I started realizing I'm not going to be able to apply for a job or even go to college and get scholarships. I was in fear of deportation. Then at 18, Yasmin boldly left the only place she had called home bound for Tijuana, hoping to find work until she could return without worry. It's not a life, honestly, to just live in fear. My boyfriend went after me and we ended up getting married. But her husband had to patiently wait for her in the States. Even her parents had legally returned to this side of the border. Yasmin was on her own for three years, waiting on her green card. Well, every day I would cry. <laughs> So how did you overcome that? I started watching YouTube videos, girls doing makeup, and my mom was like, why don't you give it a try? And I was like, you know what, you're right, I have nothing to lose. Short on cash, Yasmin receives a camera and cosmetics from her mother. But then, she accidentally burned off her lashes while heating hot water for the shower. My little tiny eyelashes. I was so sad, and it was like, no, I'm not gonna give up. I went out and bought my first false lashes. Is that incredible? Yeah. Finally, reuniting with her family in May of 2013, she continued to post and rake in ads and sponsorships, and a new dream emerged. I started seeing more and more people saying, I unfortunately don't know how to apply lashes. She decided to develop an affordable false lash line for every eye shape. Whatever fiesta that you can think of, this is for you. Today, with close to 80,000 units of lashes sold and a multi-million dollar portfolio across all of her businesses, Yasmin feels her success as a Mexican Latina immigrant is especially poignant at this time. What I try to do is use my voice for other people that feel like they need to be quiet or ashamed of like where they're coming from. And so I take this month very serious to try and use it to our advantage and just be heard. Any dream is possible. We have some samples here. They're so easy to use. And after our She Made It segment, Yasmin told us that Birdie Lashes saw an incredible boost in sales and website engagement. Most recently, the brand launched their Wing It Mascara. It's their first ever mascara with a custom dual tip, and it's waterproof too. We all love that. Yay, Birdie Lashes. All right, I love this next one too. Katherine Hamm is an entrepreneur who built her Baraby business based on comfort. And today, she's turned her homemade weighted blankets into a multi-million dollar brand. Growing up in Germany, it was normal to nap during the afternoon. And then once I moved here to the US, I realized that actually nobody is napping. I think it's almost frowned upon. Feel like you need a nap? Well, Katherine Ham has you covered. I mean, no one has a master's in blankets. So what was <laughs> your background? I used to be an economist at the World Bank. With the constant traveling, I just felt exhausted, not being able to sleep, waking up multiple times at night. It just really affects you and it affects your day. Back in 2016, Catherine researched products to help her sleep and came across weighted blankets. It was just a complete game changer for me. I slept like never before. The only problem I had with this blanket that it just made me really hot. It was filled with all these plastic beads. So it was noisy and I just realized there was no way that I could sleep under that blanket for an entire night. After getting nearly 50 no's from potential manufacturers, Catherine took matters into her own hands, enlisting her mom to knit her first prototype out of their garage. The blanket was heavy, it looked beautiful, and it felt cozy, calming, and most importantly, it didn't make me hot. So that's when I realized that we had created something really special. She called the business Baraby, a combination of the words bear hug and lullaby. Baraby officially launched online in December 2018 and sold out in two weeks. 
What was the turning point? Because you turned this into a multi-million dollar business. One morning I woke up and I had an email from West Elm in my inbox and they wanted to see our blankets and come to our New York showroom. And I mean, I almost broke down laughing because we didn't have a showroom at that time. We were just- Right, so, you're like, come to my garage and see my mother and I. I think I did what any entrepreneur would do at this stage. So how about we come to your place? So we borrowed a hotel trolley and we pushed the whole trolley with 300 pounds of blankets down the street to West Elm and they immediately loved them and they were ready to order. Baraby made over $21 million in revenue in 2020 and recently had a cameo in an iconic TV show. So we just launched in Nordstrom's Countrywide and if you happen to watch Sex in the City, you might have spotted our blankets on set. Yeah, we've been growing from two people. Wait, 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 uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just really <laughs> like blew over that. Tell us the scene. Tell us how that happened. Cynthia Nixon has a blanket and she was directing that scene. So it's like a pinch wow. me moment because I'm a huge fan. And as CEO, Catherine is trying to create a dreamy office environment for Barabee's workforce. We work from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And outside of these co-working hours, everyone can be flexible. Some people like to nap, some people like to walk their dogs, and other people like to spend time with their children. I assume that your employees respond well to that, just saying, if you get your work done whenever you can get it done, I want to encourage you to feel rested and healthy and inspire wellness. We don't have to earn rest. We actually need rest. I think it's a, it's it works wonders just to put 20 minutes on the calendar for a nap. For someone sitting at home who has an idea like this and who's not in the field they want to be in or has an idea about something that doesn't exist, what would be your best advice? Every business starts with an idea and it's more about the courage to take the first step. Doesn't that just make you want to curl up and take a good nap? Well, since Barabee's launch, the company has grown more than 5,000%. And in the spirit of Barabee's mission to create a calmer, more comforted world, this past spring, Barabee launched the Hug It, a sensory knot pillow that provides stylish stress relief. We could all use that. Okay, but don't go to sleep just yet because there's much more to come. Next, supermodel turned mogul Winnie Harlow shares her personal story of building her skincare line, plus how one woman is reinventing the ear piercing experience. We'll be right back. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You get one beautiful life to live. What are you going to do? This show is so fun, but having you as a positive force means really the world. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold, okay? We have this circle of women that love each other. I decided I'm going to go with the rhythm of life. And you love riding the way. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Oh, yeah. I love you too. <laughs> I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. Today's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to She Made It. Winnie Harlow is a groundbreaking supermodel in her own right. Here's a look how one of the biggest names in fashion took her talents from the runway to the sun care aisle. Take a look. I've been able to showcase everyone else's work, the things that they've labored on, and now I get to do the same for myself. It's a dream come true. 
For years, Winnie Harlow has been blazing a trail in the fashion industry, but now she's making strides in business as well. After everything you've been through, and I know this goes back to childhood, how important is that title for you, entrepreneur? My mom is a hairdresser and she had her own salon. My dad is a mechanic in Jamaica and still runs his own shop. I was thinking, where do I get this from? And I was just like, wait, it's in my blood, you know? It, it's from my parents. As a child, Winnie was diagnosed with the skin condition, vitiligo. It's hard enough being a kid to begin with, but right. kids were so mean and saying names to you. Tell me about your childhood. When you're in a small town, especially as a young kid, it feels like that is the end all and be all. It seems like the end of the world, but it's really just the beginning of your life. After competing on America's Next Top Model, Winnie started making a name for herself on high fashion runways and at photo shoots for big brands. Walking Victoria's Secret was incredible for me, life-changing. A lot of people don't know this, but I did try out for Victoria's Secret the year before and I didn't get it. And so getting it the second time was amazing. Like any Vogue cover I'm on, I'm the first model with Vitiligo to be on that cover. So that is mind blowing to me because I had never seen myself represented growing up. Winnie says in 2018, an incident on a set inspired her to take action. I had this horrible experience on set at a shoot where no one wanted me to apply sunscreen. It made my, my skin look purple and gray and it wasn't great for the photo shoot. So, you know, I went without to get the best shots, but after two days of shooting from sun up to sun down in the Bahamas, I was burnt to a crisp. I was like in so much pain. I had to have doctors give me injections for, for pain, for inflammation. And I realized that there wasn't sun care on the market that made you look gorgeous and also be well protected. Winnie got to work developing skincare products. I think people think you're a supermodel, things just, you know, you just, you get a line and it doesn't work like that. I had no idea where to start. I had the idea, like it's my brain child, but I had no business savvy. I think some of the most challenging things for me were one, hearing all those no's when we were, when we started fundraising, especially being a business that was created in a pandemic where things were already being pushed back with packaging and the formulas and like our factories shutting down for COVID. And, you know, there were so many steps back every time we were taking steps forward. Nearly three years later, Winnie raised $6.5 million from investors to launch K-Skin, a sun care line inspired by the beaches of her family Family's native Jamaica. I wanted to put things that I've used since I was a kid going to Jamaica and staying with my dad. They used to cut the aloe vera plant and rub it directly onto our skin for like mosquito bites or sunburns. We also have hydrating nectar, which is from different fruits and botanicals. Winnie hopes to inspire people to take care of and to love the skin they're in. What would you say as advice to young girls out there who are going through a tough time? who just like want to get through it and pursue her dream. I would say focus on yourself. There's only two things that you can really do in life. You can change things. And those things that you can't change, you got to move forward. Well, after we talked to Winnie for She Made It, the K-Skin team told us that K-Skin sales more than doubled. They've also expanded the line to include non-SPF lip and body care products, just the perfect pampering we need for fall and winter. Congratulations, Winnie. Great, great girl. Well, next up, a woman who is shaking up the piercing business. Rowan founder Louisa Schneider made it a point to create safe, hygienic, and fun piercing experiences for first-timers and those looking to get in on the ear party trend. Do your work, do your research, and don't let anyone make you feel like your idea is small. Because if you're passionate about it and you know that it resonates with other people, you were probably onto something. For entrepreneur Louisa Schneider, First-time ear piercing should not look like this scene from the hit movie Grease. Yeah. Oh! Oh. And I desperately wanted an option that I knew would be safe, but that would also be joyful. And so that was really when I started thinking about why didn't that concept exist already? Louisa launched Rowan in 2018, a company looking to turn this sometimes ignored rite of passage into an experience worthy of a special celebration. 
to me as a mom and as a woman, it was so clear that ear piercing is a milestone. And I was amazed that it had not been really modernized. So tell me how this idea started. I knew that even though malls were really suffering, one concept that continued to drive foot traffic was mall-based piercers. And around the time that my daughter was born, I took my nieces to get their ears pierced and it wasn't a great experience. <laughs> the concept was pretty crowded and cluttered and tired. And I realized at that time that I would never take my daughter there. That's when Louisa started Rowan, a concierge ear piercing and subscription box service where customers could book a licensed nurse to perform piercings in the comfort of their own home. What was your first step? We started with a small proof of concept. So two nurses that were able to do a, a number of house calls. And for us at Rowan, one of the most important things is thinking about the full experience. You may end up with an infection and that is something that we want to avoid. The business quickly grew. Louisa then opened Rowan's first piercing studio in New York City, coincidentally just half a block away from a big box store that would play a major part in the next step of their journey. I got reached out to on LinkedIn and the person who was reaching out to me had a target address and I did not think it was real. So I actually ignored it for a few weeks. And then there was another persistent outreach and I thought, well, there is a chance this is real. So I'm going to take the call. Target offered Rowan the opportunity to open full service piercing studios in stores across California. I love it. But the pandemic brought on new challenges for the company. The thought of having an intimate moment, piercing an ear during COVID was really uncertain. But as people became more knowledgeable about COVID and about safety protocol, there was this imprint of wanting a sterile environment. Rowan nurses are now in more than 200 target locations across the country. They've also opened a second standalone piercing studio, this time in Connecticut, and pierce as many as 20,000 ears a month. What do you think getting your ears pierced energetically represents? We say at Rowan, every piercing is a milestone and every milestone can be celebrated with a piercing. It's really a liberating form of self-expression. So doing it safely and having fun is really, you know, what it's all about. After our She Made It show, Rowan tells us they've since opened up nine studios across the country. And this month they are opening a location in Charlotte, North Carolina, and their very first mall location at the Mall of America. And it doesn't stop there. Chicago, Boston, and Miami, look out for a Rowan coming to you. I love hearing that. Well, up next, hear about women who made their dreams a reality from a female founder who is taking gifting to a whole new level and to a woman who's showing us that her business is on a roll. That's all coming up next. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. The general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. I think when you open your eyes, you get to decide, how's my day going to be? We want to be a way to start your day, lighten your load, every single morning. For breaking news, download the NBC News app. Hey, 
Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Welcome back to our She Made It special focused on pampering and getting ready for the holidays. You're about to meet the entrepreneurs behind innovative companies who are helping us make our lives a little bit easier. First up, Toki founder Jane Park, who is putting a creative spin on gift giving. Take a look. My parents and I immigrated from Korea when I was four. We lived above their convenience store and I did my homework behind the cash register. I loved having a front row seat to their courage and resilience. Even though I went to law school, my passion for New Horizons pulled me into entrepreneurship. I took a leap to start my first business, a beauty tech startup, in 2007. I raised millions of dollars and sold it for even more. A few years ago at Christmas, I was throwing out bags and bags of used gift wrap because most of it wasn't recyclable. I thought about how my Korean grandmother would wrap gifts in squares of cloth, which we saved to reuse again and again. So I got to work reinventing gift wrap to make it more sustainable with the digital twist by inventing a QR gift tag, which allows you to show up with your gift by uploading a photo or video. Toki means rabbit in Korean. And my hope is that our products will hop from friend to friend and celebration to celebration. Well, since our She Made It segment, Toki is now nationwide. And check this out. This summer, they just launched their latest product line, the Toki Eco Gifting Set. This line uses recycled water bottles to further reduce our emissions. And guess what? With every order of their Eco Gifting Set, Toki is giving viewers free additional bags, all with free shipping. Well, moving on to brand number two now, that's actually the name. Number two, founded by a woman who is wiping away the competition while saving the planet at the same time. Take a look. My name is Samira Farr, and to me, true luxury is living in a land plush with trees rather than cutting them down to make toilet paper. That's why I created Number Two, a stylish toilet paper that not only gives you a clean wipe, but also helps preserve our forests. In 2017, after selling my first business, I began to research the toilet paper industry. It felt outdated. I was shocked to find that TP can be made from alternative fibers like bamboo, and that there aren't a lot of brands that don't use plastic packaging. I also learned that bamboo can grow at a much faster rate than trees, making it a way more eco-friendly option. I launched number two toilet paper in 2019 and have grown from selling only online to selling from bigger home goods stores like Urban Outfitters and Lowe's Home Improvement. Customers love the strength and quality of the teepee, as well as the stylish patterns. But most importantly, they are thrilled to be saving the planet one wipe at a time. Love this. Well, number two is now introducing 100% bamboo paper towels and facial tissue. And they have exciting news. Early next year, number two is now becoming Rizzy Home and will continue to expand its line of home goods. Congratulations to them. I use this and just love the packaging. How else can you give toilet paper as a gift? Well, there's still much more to come. Up next, it's our She Made It It list for women-owned small businesses that will help you feel your best this season. We'll be right back. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. The 
general election is right around the corner. If you have voting questions, we have voting answers. Head to NBCNews.com slash plan your vote. You'll find voter registration deadlines, early voting dates, vote by mail information, and so much more. Because some of the rules have changed since 2020. And now's the time to start planning for your November vote. What's the state of the United States? That is up to you. On your mark, get set, plan your vote. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. I have even more extraordinary female-founded brands that I'm so excited to share with you on my She Made It It list. Brand number one, Dogwood Hill. In 2014, founder Jennifer Hunt saw a gap in the market for online art-driven holiday cards, so she did something about it. Jennifer's mission was to create a website where customers could go for personalized cards that eliminated the lengthy design times and pricey design fees. So. Dogwood Hill was born. With its collective of over 30 artists, Dogwood Hill is able to supply products within 10 days that are unique and personalized for you and your families. What a great way to wrap a gift and beautiful quality. All right, brand number two, Clean Circle. Lena Chow launched her skincare reusable products that replace single-use makeup wipes and cotton rounds. As the first-generation daughter whose mom worked as a seamstress, Lena knew the ins and outs of the textile industry and set out to create beauty reusables with certified clean fabrics. Clean Circle's mission is to reduce beauty waste all while protecting your skin from environmental stressors. These are great. Brand three, Palermo Body. Jessica Morelli is the founder and formulator of the skincare line that is all about nourishing the skin and stimulating the mind. At an early age, Jessica was inspired by the natural skincare practices of her Sicilian grandmother. Their revitalizing body scrub has become a favorite among customers, and just recently, Palermo Body launched their breast cancer initiative, donating $5 of every purchase of the scrub to breast cancer research. Such an unbelievable cause and really, really great products. All right, last up, Lucky 13 Candles. Lawyer and founder Amina Max started her massage oil candle company in 2019 to connect her with her then fiance and now husband. Guess it worked. So she taught herself how to make candles that turn into massage oils with all natural ingredients. Amina reports that the connection with her husband is stronger than ever, and Lucky 13 Candles will be getting into retail stores early next year. Just love this. Well, that's all for our She Made It today. Thanks so much for watching, and remember to shop these small businesses. Scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen or head over to today.com slash shop. I'm Joel Martin. I'm so excited you watched the show. Such great entrepreneurs, and we'll see you next time. Sponsored by Walmart. What up, y'all? Welcome to the Today All Day Kitchen. Pasta is a staple for so many weeknight meals. It's easy to make, pretty hard to screw up, and oh so satisfying. I'm making pillowy soft ricotta gnocchi with peas and parm in a buttery sauce. And I'm cooking up a creamy chicken stroganoff with baby bella mushrooms. And I'm whipping up a spicy vegan pasta alla vodka. So start boiling some water. It's time to use that noodle. And let's get cooking. You can shop the ingredients featured here from our sponsor, Walmart, by scanning the QR code. Today earns a commission from purchases made through links on today.com. I have to admit, pasta is one of my go-to comfort foods, so I am very excited to share this recipe with you. The first thing we want to do is take our gorgeous ricotta and actually lay it out in a thin layer on paper towels. Since the ricotta is the base of our dough, we need to remove some of that moisture so it ends up really nice and light and fluffy rather than dense. We are going to let this sit for about 12 to 15 minutes just to 
make sure that the paper towel absorbs that moisture, but lucky for me, I made one before. And here is how it ends up looking when it is done. Stunning. Okay, so now let's just make our dough. We have our ricotta right here. Plop it right on in. So we have two large eggs here. I'm going to crack them right into our bowl. One cup of finely grated Parmigiano Reggiano cheese and some kosher salt, just to awaken the flavor. Before we add in our flour, we are going to delicately mix it all together. So it creates a really light, fluffy consistency. So now that this is looking really beautifully mixed together, that is when we know it is time to start adding in our flour. It's really important here to add your flour in a quarter cup at a time because we don't want to develop too much gluten, but we also want to make sure that our ricotta stays nice and fluffy. We're just going to delicately mix it until there are no more big bits of flour, and we'll just keep mixing our final quarter cup. There we go, looking good. Now it is time to shape our gnocchi. And then we're going to take our dough mixture, kind of form it into a bit of a, it feels so good. It feels like a baby's bottom. Can we use that in the final cut? It's what it feels like. Okay, and now we're going to dust the top with a bit more flour. And this is my favorite tool whenever I'm making pasta, also whenever I'm cooking to easily pick things up. It is called a bench scraper. It's typically used for decorating cakes, making sure you have a nice smooth line of frosting around your cake, but it does such a good job of picking things up and it also does a great job of cutting things really evenly. And we are going to cut this into quarters. And the next thing we're going to do is we are going to roll this out into a beautiful snake that is about one inch thick. It feels so nice, <laughs> so soft. I like to cut off the end first, just because this end, it doesn't look as nice. And then what I'll do is I will just keep cutting little one inch pieces of pasta. And look at that. They look like little pillows, don't they? Look at how beautiful this is looking. And what we're going to do is we'll take that same bench scraper that we have, lift them up, and transfer them to a parchment lined baking sheet. All right, and we're just going to repeat this with our remaining pieces of gnocchi dough. Looking good. Before we cook our gnocchi, I wanna get started on the star of our sauce. This is a lemon butter sauce, so we are going to be using the zest and juice of two gorgeous lemons. And I'm going to show you my favorite way to prepare lemon zest. So we're just going to take the peeler and run it along lengthwise on this lemon, pulling the zest off of the lemon. So I'm just gonna remove any of this extra pith. And the reason why I'm removing this pith is because the pith is a bit bitter and we don't want any of that bitterness. And as you can see, I've stacked up all of this lemon into cute little, almost soldiers, if you will. Take your knife and rock it back and forth along that peel. It smells amazing. And you can see how beautiful these strips are. And then what we'll do is we'll take these shreds and turn them, and then we will run our knife across again to mince that lemon. And it took me a while to master these skills, let me tell you. It really all comes down to practicing over and over and over again. It's really repetition here. 
And now I'm just gonna take my knife and run through this a few more times. It's smelling absolutely amazing. Look at that zest though, I mean, it's like freshly fallen snow. <laughs> okay, let's clean up, get our water a boiling, and finish up this gnocchi. Our water is boiling, it is time to cook our gnocchi, and you gotta pay attention because this all happens pretty quickly. But I promise you, you have all of the tools to absolutely crush it. The first thing we wanna do is salt our water. I'm taking kosher salt. Okay, this is boiling beautifully, and we can use our fingers to plop these in, because let me tell you, they are light and pillowy, and Dropping them all in at once is going to cause them to smush together. We want these to cook until they float to the top, okay? They basically tell us, they're like, hey, what's up? And then to save some time, we are actually going to take our frozen peas and we're gonna pop those in as well. So this pasta water is liquid gold. I call it unicorn juice whenever I'm cooking because all of the starch in the water itself is actually going to help bind our sauce together. And we're going to start adding in our cubed unsalted butter a couple tablespoons at a time. You really want it to be cold butter because our goal here is to really emulsify everything. Take a whisk. Start whisking everything up. The gnocchi's starting to float. And now we are ready to bring our sauce and our gnocchi together. I've actually turned off the heat. If it is too hot, it may cause your sauce to break. So just make sure you turn that heat off. Next up, we're going to add in half of our lemon zest. How good does this look? Okay, next up, we are going to slowly add in our parm. Keep on mixing it back and forth so that it melts in a nice, even fashion. It is smelling so good. And as you can see, it is really looking super glossy. Mm, and it is tasting delish. So add in the lemon juice a little bit at a time. Again, we want to emulsify this in. We don't want to freak out the gorgeous sauce that we just worked so hard to build. It is coating all of those beautiful pillows of gnocchi. And now it is time to plate it up. Oh my gosh, you guys, how gorgeous does this look? Okay, a little extra parm, some freshly ground black pepper, and then I'll take a little bit of fresh mint, a little drizzle of olive oil, gives the pasta gorgeous sheen, and there you go, homemade ricotta gnocchi in a lemon butter sauce with peas and mint. I'm so excited to try this. It is melting in my mouth. The parm adds the perfect amount of nuttiness and saltiness. I don't have any other words to say except I know you're gonna love this. Mm. The general election is right around the corner. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about and you'll instantly get voting rules. See the next big deadline, learn how to take action for your plan, and even help others make their plans. Voting rules have changed since 2020 and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for November. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT Act. 
back. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. Just got, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Danny. You are out. I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. When you hear stroganoff, you're probably thinking beef. But this creamy comfort food pairs incredibly well with chicken. But the best part about this dish is that it all comes together in one pot. Less mess is always a win in my kitchen. All right, so first we're gonna do is we're gonna make our dry rub. I like to use a little bit of smoked paprika. You can use the regular paprika too, but I think smoke flavors just bring a lot more body to your recipes. And then a little bit of dry thyme, and then a little bit of garlic powder. Give that a good swish. All right, now let's move on to our chicken breast. Now I've just got some lean, skinless chicken breasts, and I'm not sure about you, but I like to cut mine up into smaller pieces. The reason why, it's gonna cook a lot faster. All right, y'all, let's add this to our bowl. Get your hands all up in there. Don't be scared to get your hands dirty. I'm gonna just rinse off the cutting board and wash our knife so we can prep the mushrooms. Okay, now I'm gonna be using some Baby Bella mushrooms. I think they're super delicious. I'm just gonna slice this into small slices just like this. So I've got a ton of mushrooms here and you're probably thinking, yo, okay, that's not gonna fit in my pan. Don't worry, mushrooms are kinda like spinach. Once you start cooking them and add some heat to them, they shrivel up really, really small. So they will fit, I promise you that. Our mushrooms are cut up. I'm gonna set these aside. And now we're gonna fire up our pan and get cooking. All right, we're gonna place this on a medium high heat. Okay, with it nice and hot, in goes the oil. This is a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of heart health, a little sprinkle of that. Then I like to grab some tongs and in goes our chicken. Ooh, I love that sizzle sound. We want a nice sear, a nice color on the chicken. There we go. You're gonna wanna cook this for about four to five minutes on each side, and then look at this. Oh, just lift it up, and look at that beautiful color on the chicken. Move it around a little bit. If you're feeling brave, you can go ahead and toss it, but again, this is a no mess recipe, so <laughs> the least amount of mess you can make in your kitchen, the better. This chicken is just about ready. I'm gonna move my mushrooms a little bit closer. And then, I'm gonna use my tongs. I'm gonna start taking out the pieces of chicken. Oh my God, look at that. It's just looking so good. Kev, you did that. If you're not your best cheerleader in the kitchen, I don't know what you're doing. You gotta just give yourself a pat on the back. It smells so good, it looks so good. Exactly what we want. I'm gonna set this over here. Now. I'm gonna add in the mushrooms now. Now there's a lot of chicken flavor here. Ready, so we want that. Oh, we've got a good sear here. I'm just gonna wilt them just a little bit by using a little bit of our chicken broth. That's a little bit, just to create some steam. And also this is gonna help to deglaze the bottom of our skillet as well. I'm gonna get my salt bay on, give me a little pinch of salt, just a little bit, mm -mm. boom. And the cool thing about mushrooms is that as they're shrinking up too, you know they're just soaking up all this flavor. So people that say, I don't like mushrooms, I'm like, yo man, mushrooms are like flavor bombs. They make your mouth water. It's that umami factor. More love to mushrooms this year. Now we're gonna try to create a little bit of a thick gravy here. We're gonna add in a little bit of flour. I'm gonna give this a quick toss first. Then we're gonna add in about a cup of our chicken broth. And what you'll see here, you're gonna still deglaze, but you see now the chicken broth is really cloudy 
and that's because it's turning into that gravy that we want. I'm also gonna add in a little bit of Dijon. And just keep stirring, keep stirring. And this is looking beautiful. All right, now let's begin to bring everything together. In goes our chicken broth. Reserve some, then grab yourself the egg noodles, sprinkle those on, and then pour in the rest of that broth. And the noodles are going to absorb all of this liquid that's now like a gravy. So we're gonna bring it to a light simmer and you can see right here inside that the little light simmer going, that's just about right. And then we're gonna cover and cook this for about seven minutes. Oh my gosh, I stirred these once. Oof, they are looking good. Always check your noodles. And if you're thinking like, Kev, it's looking a little watery, what am I gonna do? Don't worry, I got you. Remember that it's gonna thicken up as it cools, but also it's gonna thicken up because we're going to add in our Greek yogurt now. Greek yogurt is really high in protein and it's really, really, really thick. And look at this. It looks like I added cheese, but I have not at all. And this is our swap for sour cream. Last bit of work, we're gonna add in our chicken. Well, you can't be here to smell it, but I'm just gonna describe it. We need that smell of vision from Willy Wonka. So I'm gonna plate it right here and finish it off with some fresh parsley. You like some other chicken? Try this chicken stroganoff. You're seeing it first here today and then today all day kitchen. I'm just gonna hit it with some fresh black pepper. Ooh, look at that. I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited about eating. Here we go. Get a little bit of mushroom, a little bit of noodle, and then some of this succulent, lean chicken breast. Oh my God. Mm. Yeah, this will make you get happy in church. Ooh, there you go. <laughs> I guarantee your friends and family are going to love this dish. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. There's another legal filing today, and I want to cut through some of the weedsy stuff. And let's just, like, get to the point. They have started to vote on the PACT. If you're like, Hallie, stop speaking Washingtonese. This bill would basically give health care to veterans who have exposed to these toxic chemicals. So Scott, I'm trying to make this as not D.C. as possible. The increased sort of anger that we've seen now in politics. I saw you searching for, I think, your microphone, Dan. Yeah. You are, oh, I was you trying to do it on the slide. Live TV, man. It's okay. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. I grew up on Staten Island, so I can't even tell you how many pasta dishes I've eaten over the years. One of my absolute favorites is penne alla vodka. So today, I'm giving that beautiful pink sauce a vegan makeover. And I'm putting a little twist on that penne too. Let's get started with the crunchy breadcrumb topping. So first, I'm going to get a small skillet over medium-low heat, and we're going to add in a little bit of olive oil. 
So for our breadcrumbs, we're gonna use panko breadcrumbs. I love using panko because it's extra crunchy and it's plain, so we can add anything to it and really manipulate those flavors. And the way we're gonna do that is by adding some red chili flakes because we want this spicy and a little bit of nutmeg to really round out those flavors and add that earthy component. A little bit of kosher salt and a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. And just we're gonna cook this over medium low until it gets a nice golden brown color. So we're essentially just toasting it in the pan. This usually takes about five minutes to get nice and golden and crispy. This is a test. If it loosely moves in the pan, that means it's ready. So to start off any good sauce, you have to start off with your aromatics. We're gonna start with one medium white onion and some garlic. So we just wanna get a small dice on this. And next up, garlic. We're using about four cloves of garlic. I just like to give them a light crush to help me with the chopping process. Another great way to prep all of this is actually just blitzing it up in a food processor. Just putting it on chop and giving it a few pulses and it'll all be roughly chopped. So you wanna start off with a really large pan and get it over medium high heat. To this, we're gonna add a layer of olive oil and we're also gonna add in one tablespoon of vegan butter. Traditional vodka sauce is so indulgent and creamy, so we're gonna add a few vegan options to help bring that creaminess to the sauce. So now that our oil is hot and the butter is sizzling, let's go in with our onion and garlic. You also wanna get some salt in at this point because that's gonna help the onions sweat out all of their moisture. Now, I said this was spicy vodka sauce, so now come in our spicy elements. We're gonna add some red chili flakes, but let's not stop there. We're gonna add in one of my favorite chili peppers, Calabrian chilies. And I just so happen to be wearing chili earrings to celebrate the occasion. So we wanna cook these for about five minutes until the onions are sweating and almost translucent. So now let's go in with our tomato paste. The tomato paste is gonna add basically a really concentrated tomato flavor. So it's gonna feel like we've been cooking this sauce all day, but really, we haven't been. So get this incorporated into the onions. So, the star of the show, some vodka. No, this is not a shot for me. This is for the pasta, maybe that'll be later. So once we add the vodka in, all of that alcohol is gonna evaporate, so you don't have to worry about any alcohol actually being in there, but the flavor of the vodka will become concentrated, which is what adds that unique flavor to vodka sauce, which I happen to love. We're gonna go in with some crushed tomatoes. We're gonna go in with a little sugar. Now, don't hate on this. This is really gonna help balance the flavors again. There's a lot of acidity in the tomatoes, and then we also have a lot of spice, so the sugar is gonna help round everything out. As well as some dried oregano. So I actually like to take this and rub it in between my fingers to get the oils in the oregano activated. We want our spicy vodka sauce to be smooth and silky, and in order to achieve that, we're gonna use an immersion blender. This looks great, look how vibrant that is. It really is starting to look like vodka sauce. So now we're gonna add a few dairy elements to our sauce. We're gonna add a little bit of vegan creamer, as well as some vegan cream cheese. So you wanna make sure to incorporate all of that in, and you can see the color is this beautiful light orange vodka sauce color. We're gonna add in one whole sprig of fresh basil. Right in, and we're gonna let that simmer with the sauce. Okay, let's check in our pasta water. Oh, it's boiling. Before we do anything, we always wanna salt our pasta water. 
And now for our pasta. I just want to show you guys how fun this is. So this is called a colony Pompeii. I think colony means column and Pompeii is obviously a city in Italy. But to me, it's just a beautiful large fusilli and it looks delicious to eat. So we're gonna get these in. This pasta is so big, it takes about 10 or 12 minutes to cook. So I'm gonna start cleaning up and get everything out of the way and get ready to plate. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hey, podcast fans. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content. And everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. You get one beautiful life to live. Jenna doesn't stop till it's sold. We have this circle of women that love each other. This is a moment we're in right now. This is really electric. Love you. I love you too. <laughs> now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We feel like we're right there with you. Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. Hey, podcast fans, ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. Our pasta looks ready, so let's add it into our vodka sauce. Beautiful. 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 This is so fun. Look at these swirls. And this is liquid gold. This is our starchy salted water. So we're actually gonna add a little ladle into our pasta to make it even silkier. You wanna make sure to gently combine this with the sauce because we don't wanna break up our beautiful giant swirls of pasta. Look how fun this looks. I'm so excited to eat it, but we can't forget about our spicy, crunchy breadcrumb topping. So it's now completely cooled, so we can just use our hands to garnish it as if we were garnishing it with Parmesan. And then if we wanna be extra fancy, we can add a little sprig of fresh basil. Okay, I've waited long enough, so we're now ready to dig in. I'm so excited to eat this shape. I feel like the proper way is from the bottom. Wow. I think Staten Island would be proud. This is so delicious and so fun. Look at that. Chef's kiss. This is delicious. Good morning, it's Tuesday. Our top story, new fears over the growing triple-demic. Yeah, we've got what you need to know. It is October 25th, and this is today. Push to the brink. Some hospitals now over capacity with flu, respiratory illnesses, and new 